Hi, hello everyone. Hello and welcome to a really, really beautiful day in Philadelphia. My name is Cassandra Zanier and I am the founder and uh, director of the 16th annual Black Women's Arts Festival. Our venue is the Rotunda. The Rotunda is a, an award-winning, wonderful um, community cultural arts venue in West Philadelphia. It's affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania. It's in University City. And it's been our primary venue since our inception in 2003. Last year we were virtual and this year we are virtual again. Most likely, depending on how things go with the pandemic, most likely, hopefully next year we will be back in person. Um, but we are streaming live through Zoom and on the YouTube platform. And we will be archived at the YouTube uh, platform as well. So I'm very excited to share with you the list of um, Black women artists who are gonna be featuring today. Um, at 1.10, we have Tamara El Xavier who will be doing a movement lecture and lecture. At 2 p.m., we have Kai Oceans who will be doing an inspirational talk. At 2.30, we have Glynis Reed, who's a fine artist and will be doing a PowerPoint presenta presentation about her work. She's also a poet. At 3 p.m., we have uh, O, who's a, an unforgettable performance artist. At 3.45, we have a, a duo called Bad Girls Inc. And they'll be doing music. At 4.40, we have poet Stephanie Duran. At five o'clock, uh, somebody named Cassandra Xavier will be performing. <laughs> That's me, I'll be singing. And at 5.20, Erica Richards, who is an illustrator, will be doing a PowerPoint presentation. At 6.10, we're doing a, a PowerPoint presentation called In Memoriam, um, celebrating the, the lives of Monette Sudler and Niyama Williams, Dr. Niyama. Williams. At 6.30, we have a spoken word artist named Sincere Melody, who's also known as uh, Sean Fulton. And that's uh, today's uh, schedule for tomorrow, Sunday, also from one o'clock until 7 p.m. We will have Sincere Melody at 1.10. We will have, uh, at 1.30, we'll have Angel Hogan, who's a poet. At 1.50, Tamara El Xavier, movement lecture. At, well, at 2.30, Kai Oceans, another inspirational talk. At 3.10, filmmaker Aisha Mullock. I'm sorry, that's when she'll be introduced. She'll be actually on at 3.15. At 3.50, author-performer Nikki Powerhouse will be in the house. 4.35, sorry, 4.40, Erica Richards, the fine artist, the illustrator, will be doing a PowerPoint presentation. 5.30, Glynis Reed will be doing um, a presentation of her fine art and poetry. At 5.50, Keisha Oliver, who is an artist and a writer, and at 6.10, Ghetto Songbird will be uh, closing the evening and the weekend. And uh, I think she'll be performing with her children again. She did that last year, and she's been actually kind of touring with her kids. And um, that's always very exciting. I'm trying to time it so that um, we, Tamara doesn't start until 1.10. <laughs> so I'm going to talk some more. The Black Women's Arts Festival started in 2003. I founded it. And for the first several years, um, I co-ran it with Spirit McIntyre, who is now a New Orleans-based artist. Spirit is a cellist and a lyricist and a composer and a vocalist. 
So we ran it together for several years. And then Spirit ran it by herself for a couple of years. Then after that, I ran it by myself for a while. We have been with, uh, we've, we've been under the umbrella of a 501c3 nonprofit a couple of times. First, we were, we were with New Beginnings Nonprofit in, uh, Incubator of uh, Resources for Human Development. And another time we were under the umbrella of Moonstone Arts. But most of the time we've been a for-profit. Sometimes we've been nonprofit, sometimes we've been for-profit. And, um, and the second time uh, somebody co-produced it with me was Amor La Luna. She uh, co-produced it, and I don't remember the years, but, but like Spirit McIntyre, she did an amazing job. And, um, and since then, I've been at the helm of it. So it's had a long history and, and we have had it gone on, we've gone on hiatus a couple of times. Because if you do the math, uh, we started in 2003, yet in 2022, we're having our 16th annual. So that's because we've had a couple of um, hiatuses. And, uh, but it's, overall a steady thing and it's a very very wonderful and special event and i cannot wait until we're in person again now feels like a good and juicy time to introduce tamara so let me look up her bio in my trusty phone tamara xavier she her is a cisgender daughter sister mother and lover of wisdom Trivia, she used to use the name Moon Wisdom when she was dancing a lot, um, really into wisdom. Her undergraduate studies in history and women's studies at Rutgers College in New Brunswick, New Jersey, informed her decision to pursue graduate work in dance at Temple University in the 90s. She co-produced the award-winning documentary, No, the Rape Documentary, directed by author, activist, educator, Aisha Shahida Simmons, and succeeded in including dance in the film on par with poetry. Tamara, who happens to be my sister, holds an M.E.D. and Ph.D. from Temple University's Esther Boyer College Music and Dance. She is grateful to participate in the 2022 Black Women's Arts Festival and will present a written work coupled with an improvised dance work. Please welcome dancer choreographer, scholar Tamara L. Xavier, PhD. All right, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, Cassandra. Um, I would like to begin my presentation first by thanking Cassandra Xavier for inviting me to participate in this year's Black Women's Arts Festival. I'm always excited to share in a weekend of interdisciplinary creativity by women of African descent. I also wanna thank Earl Isaac who will be assisting me later with the sound and camera uh, during the dance portion of my presentation. Um, at the 2021 Black Women's Arts Festival, I read an excerpt from the foreword of Dance We Do, a poet explores Black dance by Ntokaki Shange. This year, I begin by reading from the chapter in that book entitled Haliki Oshimare. A lot of people, this is a quote from a Dr. Halifu Osamari. A lot of people don't understand that dance is a total integration of the mind, body, and spirit. When you truly dance, that's what you're doing. It's not just learning some steps or routines really well. It's about finding a way to integrate your mind and your spirit with your body as you express yourself. Dr. Halifu Osamari is Professor Emerita in the Department of African-American and African Studies at University of California, Davis. 
she was one of Ntisaki Shange's dance teachers and eventually invited Ms. Shange to join her company. I would like to take a moment and also read from this book. Um, let's see. <laughs> Into the Sunlight. Uh, can you see this? So it's called Non Domi. Nandomi, an initiate's journey into Haitian Vodou by Mimwoz Boubouin. Um, if people are uh, knowledgeable of popular culture, uh, Racine music in Haitian culture, they'll know the uh, band Bookman Experience and Mimwoz Boubouin and her husband, uh, Lolo, they lead that band. And so this is her journey. Uh, and there's an excerpt I'd like to read briefly, which speaks a little bit about that connection between body consciousness as far as a, a linguistic connection here. This is from chapter eight, Knowledgeable in Mystical Consciousness is the title of chapter eight, Kore. From a linguistic point of view, Kore, a word derived from the word core, should mean to make one with the body. Nevertheless, from the time she began teaching me, Aunt Tansia taught me that the word was of African origin. In effect, among the Bambara Monday, Monday speakers, core means the highest degree of consciousness. In the Haitian vocabulary, based on the French lexicon, when this word is attributed to a human being, mshekor, you understand right away that it refers to someone who is respected by others because of either his intellectual knowledge or his magical power. The meaning of kore changes according to the context in which it's used. For example, if you say to someone who is gorged on food, your stomach is well filled. So the connection among various peoples of African descent between the body and consciousness is much closer in when you study different cultural contexts than other cultural contexts. And this has very much informed my uh, drive to continue formal and informal studies on movement, the body, dances, art, um, African philosophies, and many other topics. Um, dance for most of my life uh, has been a sanctuary where I experience what is described by Dr. Osamari as a total integration. You may be familiar with the saying, dance as if no one is watching. This statement assumes the fact that a dance is something to be watched and the dancer should dance freely without a care about who is watching. Of course, when you study dance as an art, your audience is front of mind because people don't wanna see a self-indulgent work of art. You don't wanna waste people's time who came to see your show, right? Nevertheless, the paradox remains. Spend weeks in rehearsal, if you're lucky, <laughs> weeks of rehearsal, so that the end result looks effortless. Practice your craft without over-intellectualizing the process. One of my dance teachers at Temple University, Darla Stanley, described on her syllabus that she was interested in seeing us make, quote, heartfelt dances, unquote. That has stuck with me and inspired me over the years when I choreograph dance works. Um, just one moment, please. Okay, all right, just, just one moment. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, the beauty of dance to me is that there is a holistic approach to whatever subject is being expressed in the dance. Um, just just one moment, just one moment. I, I apologize. I'm just gonna put myself on mute. Just one second. Um, Earl, come back right away at 1.30. I apologize, this is real life. <laughs> this is real life. All right. Um, let me go back. Uh, the beauty of dance to me is that there is a holistic approach to whatever subject is being expressed in the dance. 
since the instrument of the art is the human body who is quote unquote played. There are countless outcomes, endless possibilities when it comes to expressing ideas from the personal to the political or the personal as the political or the political as personal or any way you wanna say. 20 years ago, I made a dance called Metamorphosis where M-E-T-A was separate from the rest of the word, all capitalized. And then M-O-R in the parentheses, there was a T, was a separate uh, section of the word followed by P-H-O-S-I-S, which focused on transformation. I am still exploring the idea of growing and transforming because I'm fa fascinated by what it takes to change ourselves from habits to mindset, from words to thoughts, from dreams to actions, etc. I think about the term embodied cosmology and imagine the worlds within myself and how I've been able to manifest some of them out here in the real world. I observe how the external world affects my own thinking and perspective of things. Taken as a metaphor, the setting I chose for my dance today being outside, it's a metaphor to determine what I decide to do in the moment. How does the environment that we find ourselves in help or hinder the decisions that we feel we're able to make for ourselves? At this time, I'm going to briefly give a background of my own dance journey from nine years old when I first took first, um, my first uh, dance class which didn't last for very long, um, but I danced socially mostly as a child at family gatherings and people who know me would, would know this already, but I am always really proud to say that whenever the Haitian music compa would come on and I got a chance to dance with someone, they usually would say, oh yeah, you're born here, but we can tell you're Haitian because of the way I was able to, um, move to that music compa that is my heart that's the, that is nobody knows about haitian compa it's it's the best beat ever <laughs> um so then um, high school college is where i began dancing um publicly by after joining the haitian association at rutgers university i went, attended rutgers college in new brunswick new jersey in the early 1990s and joined their dance troupe and had the best time and learned folkloric uh, Haitian dances on an informal basis and performed them with the group um, of uh, dancers uh, at that at workers. It was, it was amazing. Um, as the, my bio said, my degrees um, and studies in women's studies and in history uh, helped encourage me to uh, pursue more education at Temple University and study under amazing dance professors, Dr. Brent, Brenda Dixon Gottschild, Dr. Kariamu Welsh, who passed away unfortunately recently, um, Dr. Sarah Hilsendagger, many, many great professors there at Temple. And um, it became a, an intellectual pursuit as well as a physical body pursuit. Now, presently, I do have a job that's outside of the dance world, although I think the dance world is everywhere. <laughs> it's not specific to any particular um, line, um, budget, budget line in an academic or any other setting. But um, my day-to-day -day work is not comprised of uh, pursuing choreography or writing about dance. So I love having this opportunity when Cassandra invites me to take some time to share uh, my ideas about dance. Um, I'm going to take a few more minutes uh, and then I'm going to do a brief 
uh, dance uh, demonstration uh, about the Haitian dance I've been studying I, for the longest time, Yon Balu, before I perform. Uh, so the performance um, probably about, I timed it right about 1.45. Um, okay, I did want to briefly talk about one um, aspect of uh, creating dances, choreography, and music, uh, which of course is time. I mean, it deals with everything in life. <laughs> We're talking about time. Time can also be taken as a metaphor when speaking about music or dance, and silence or stillness can change the tone of what is being made. Um, I do not believe we will ever return to life as it was pre COVID 19, unless a cure is found. And time as it was spent during the numerous lockdowns really brought many of us to new realizations that simply did not have the space to present themselves before. Have you changed the way you spend your time? Are you more aware of making time to do the things that really matter to you? Do you spend more time thinking about the past or the future? Do you see them in a different light? These are some of the questions I'm asking myself in this moment. <clears throat> There's also another text that I wasn't quite sure in what context to bring it up, but I just wanted to share another um, profound work of research by uh, Sybil Fisher, and it's called Modernity Disavowed, Haiti and the Cultures of Slavery in the Age, Age of Revolution. The text, I, I wanted to, um, mention it for people who are not familiar with the work and are interested in learning about Haiti and the revolution that occurred in Haiti. It's an amazing text. And since I couldn't find a smooth way to, to introduce it or to incorporate it, but I just know I, I just had to mention it because I think uh, it's really good reading for anybody um, who's interested. Uh, here. Uh, one more note about uh, the choice, my choice of music when I get to the dance performance part of my presentation. <clears throat> the um, song I'm going to be performing is by Neka Egbuna, who is a Nigerian singer, songwriter, and actress. Her fourth album, Love Supreme, has been on heavy, heavy, heavy rotation in my home and bar since its release early this year on her label, Bush, I'm sorry, Bush Queen Music, Bush Queen Music. On the website, wepluggoodmusic.com, one reads NECA's commentary on the process of making this, her first album in eight years. Quote, I just wanted to vibe. I feel my, no, sorry. Quote, I just wanted to vibe, feel myself without doubt, without any defiance towards my work, honestly, unquote. She highlights three tracks on the album in this um, website, the commentary, which addresses, which address the evolution of the self, surrendering, surrendering the ego and quote, allowing silence to breathe space between people and learning to see others as a reflection of yourself. So I'm coming now to the end of my written presentation. I, as I said, I'm going to give a brief um, movement uh, demonstration uh, related to the form of Yon Valu. And afterwards we'll perform an untitled improvised dance to one of Neka's songs on the Love Supreme album called Buckle Up. Maybe you know it, hopefully you do. Uh, Kitty Empire in her review of the album for The Guardian stated, quote, there are bangers here that deserve a wider audience, unquote. I'm sure Buckle Up would be on her, one on her list, even though she didn't mention it um, by name. I thought I would set a dance piece. Uh, uh, I thought I would set a dance piece to this song, uh, and, but I couldn't make myself uh, repeat the same phrases. So as I was trying to decide, okay, this is gonna, this is what I'm gonna do. 
it just never kept coming back. New ideas kept coming each time. So I gave up the quote unquote plan and decided to let the music come that wants to come in the moment. Buckle up. All right, so we're gonna start first with, um, I'm gonna put the phone down where I believe I tested this correctly. Um, Earl, I'm going to do a quick warm up. So at um, 1.45, be ready, okay? Earl Isaac, my uh, technical support there, came back on time, thank you very much. And he's my son, <laughs> very mature 10 year old. I don't get paid. And he doesn't get paid, sadly. sadly. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, so everyone can still see me, right? And everyone can still hear me. All right, so first we're just going to <clears throat> take a deep breath in. And then you're gonna going to buckle up. <clears throat> this is going to be about 15 minutes. Anyone watching who would like to join me, feel free. I will be taking my time. It will be difficult to follow. We're just going to stand feet hip width apart. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll speak up a bit. Taking a deep breath in. And breathing out. Again, inhale and exhale. Two more, inhale exhale. Last one, inhale and exhale. A few side bends. Inhale. Exhale. The other side. Inhale. Exhale. One more time. Each side. Inhale. Exhale, and this side, inhale, and exhale. Now we're going to bring the forehead down, look down to the ground, chin to chest, and lift up. Down and up, down and up, down and up, down and Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then ear to shoulder. Straight, left shoulder. Look up. Right shoulder and left shoulder. Two more, right and left. One more time. Breathe into your neck, relax your shoulders. And then we'll take the full circle in one direction a few times.
And then we're going to reverse it. Going left, back, forward, side. Release any tension in the neck and the shoulders. Roll the shoulder blades, roll the shoulder socket. Opening up in the chest, squeezing shoulder blades together. And we're gonna reverse it. Moving forward with the shoulders. Opening the back, spreading those shoulder blades together apart. And rest. And small hip circle. Going slightly outside of the space of the knee, real gentle. Keep breathing. And reverse it. Yeah. Whoa, aha. Feeling those 50 years, are we? Yes. And one more circle. All right, it's going to be few minutes or by dance, I'm going to demonstrate the dance Yambalu. Yambalu can be put in any part of your body. Uh, mostly you see it in the arms, you see it in the hands, the wrists, and the spine in choreography um, of traditional Haitian folklore music, uh, dance, dance. So we see the arms, but the, what's most popular usually is seeing it in the spine. So as it's performed in dance ceremonies, religious ceremonies, usually the knee is bent deeply, as deeply as you can. And you lean the torso forward. As you step forward, you tuck the pelvis under with the foot moving through to the toes, move through and you step down and you wave the spine. There is a whole discussion about water imagery with Haitian Vodou, which we don't have time for today. And I'll demonstrate again. People can do this dance for hours in ceremonial um, environments in Haitian Voodoo. People have used it in choreography in secular spaces. And it's very, very popular, very well known. But that has been the dance that I have been, had been, continue to be fascinated by and to study. Um, it's a little bit early, but I'm going to go ahead so that there's time for questions. And I think this is a good time to um, perform the dance work and then see if there's time for questions. Okay, Earl, Maestro. <laughs> okay, excuse me. All right, so I am going to ask my sound person. Um, let's please uh, interrupt if you can't hear the music. We'll have the music with another phone next to this one. So I think it should be okay. But let me know if um, interrupts fine if, if you can't hear anything. So you're just gonna put it right down there. 
when it's ready to begin. Oh, oh don't, don't put it flat. So nothing, just put it flat the way it was when we were practicing it. Yes, thank you.
Okay, so that's the dance piece. I have, I know, like 10 more minutes for the presentation time. Cassandra, I don't know if you're still there. Do you have any questions for me? This is a good Q&A time. I didn't, I know. I am here. I am here and I do have, I might be able to come up with a couple of questions, but it just so happens that it would be very handy if we were to close your set five minutes earlier. Oh yeah. So that I could, uh, would that work? It's yeah, fun. because I, I didn't look and, and yeah, for scheduling purposes. Um, Good, I'm glad. Yeah. It's worked for you. So we're at, so rather than close at 150, we can close at, yeah, let's aim for 150 rather than 55. How okay. do you feel in your feelings areas? How do I feel in my feelings? I feel fine. I feel so, fine. So, you know, the thing, when I was watching you dance, it just seemed like such a sacred thing to me to see these movements, these Haitian folkloric movements, and to see things that made me think of cleaning myself with water. You know, some of the movements you were doing were kind of like, I'm cleaning myself with water. and just the Yavalu that you were doing in the spins, it just seemed very sacred. So I was wondering if being out in a place with nature, cause I know whenever I'm outside singing, cause you know, I do that every day. <laughs> but in the times that I've been outside singing, singing to the trees, I like to call it, it's a very sacred experience for me. So I wonder if doing these dances, one, feels sacred to you, period, and two, that feeling of sacredness amplified by being by being surrounded by plants and the sun and the wind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't um, a coincidence that I really felt I wanted today's presentation, tomorrow's. I wanted this year's presentation to be outdoors. Um, last year, we spoke inside. We had a conversation and. And when you think about dance, most of the time you're thinking about concert, stage, audience, theater, and you're thinking about inside. Um, but I'm just learning just to follow my intuition. I'm not going to, you know, um, uh, you know, make it overthink it. But I just felt very strongly that today's presentation, even though I wasn't sure what I would find, would there be too much outside noise, you know, tech, you know, concerns. I had concerns, but I felt, you know, it's going to work out um, and we'll be able to do it outside both days. So I, I do think um, we'll do what you know, I'm not telling you anything new, but it's very based on nature. It's, 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 and it's also very grounded in, in water and the philosophies of water. Um, when people most popularly, Bruce Lee, you know, made, um, it's very popular, even musicians. Tori Amos has a song based on Bruce Lee's, um, you know, saying, be like water. PJ, PJ Harvey, 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 is it PJ Harvey? He's, he, uh, he oh, has no, a song. He, but it's not PJ Harvey. Oh, PJ Morton, I think has a song with um, Nas and Stevie Wonder. It's also with the hook of be like water. So. So in a lot of different philosophies, when you're fighting, you know, and, and with this weekend being, you know, the woman king, of course, we cannot not talk about, you know, the woman king coming out this weekend. But when we're talking about battles, we're talking about struggles, we're talking about, um, sometimes people feel they're in a war, you know, war zone. Um, a lot of times in martial art, art uh, martial art um, uh, philosophy beyond the, the physical aspects um, are, you know, use water as a metaphor for its ability to change, for its ability to be strong, um, to be soft, adaptability. All of these strategies are really useful in survival as a survival technique, you know? So um, 
the the chapter that uh, I took, I read an excerpt from on Dr. Halifu Osamari uh, also mentions in that chapter her take on because she studied Haitian Buddhism. She's actually a certified Dunham teacher, uh, cert, uh, master Dunham technique teacher, and so she is mentioned in that book by Nsaki Shange how she um, described the movements of the Haitian culture as being connected to nature because it's a mountainous land, because of the mountain, because of the environment, that the movements also echoed the resilience of the Haitian people. And of course we know currently, it always seems that way, like contemporarily Haitian, it, it, it's like wrecked with violence and I'm gonna get emotional, so I'm not gonna talk about that aspect right now. But, um, but yes, I feel like it's very, um, I felt like I, it should be, uh, while the beat is funky and you want, you know, I can see it in the club, but it, it, there's also something about NECA as a musician. She's um, always combining spirituality with her uh, like ideas of political, she's Nigerian. So there's a lot um, with the government of Nigeria and the, uh, the religious, uh, fundamentalism there. So anyway, there's so many things. There's always so many things um, combined. But yes, the, the need to ground yourself, the need to center yourself spiritually is um, pretty, pretty basic. Not that this isn't going to make you get all weepy, but what does uh, dance do for you? Um, so, I mean, I think it helps me appreciate life. It really helps me because it helps me connect to my breath and it helps me connect to, to my whole being. And so when, when I'm in an active state of, of movement and it doesn't have to be dance, you know, it could just be just physical activity um so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to have music or um but 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 dance dance has so many um things that combine together um maybe i said this last year but a professor at temple dr coco i don't know her full name um but her tag is compton arthur author Compton author on IG. Um, and she speaks of dance as medicine, as, as it's something that um, covers your, um, or, uh, the, the holes that, I, I'm pretty sure I said this last year, <laughs> um, but the, when people uh, are wanting things from you, the act, like dancing can help store up yourself, restore yourself you know, with the energy that you need um, in, in living in just daily life. So that's what, that's, that's, it helps me to keep it together. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your gifts and knowledge with us and your interests. You're welcome. So, you, know, you've, you know, I feel that I've been educated. You've, you've re referenced many people. So if any of us are at all interested, uh, you've given us some names to check out. So I really appreciate that. And it's just always, always exciting to see how an artist does their work. What inspires them? How do they think of, I think when you and I shared an apartment and you'd come in and start dancing to, you would, you went into this whole Tori Amos spell for a while. And, but he's even fashion, you really liked Isaac, you know, Isaiah Miyaki, Miyaki, that guy and the Japanese designer and just this is things that you know you were inspired by and how you would create from that that was always very interesting for me to watch so thank you for sharing today and uh thank you for having I, me I'm looking really forward to um yeah I, I this is a strange question but since I'm outside and I'm planning to like move inside so okay I'm going to sign out but I can just go on YouTube and watch the rest of the the day, right? Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Okay. Either, either zoomed in or through through YouTube. And, yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the day and, and tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful.
Uh, Gina just sent you the direct link to the live stream. Okay. Um, so, all right, love. Thank you so right. much. Thank you. All right. Have a great all right. Say good, say good job to Earl for us as well. Okay. For all right. I will. I'm just trying to actually now. All right. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. So that was Tamara Lynn Xavier, PhD, my sister. I'm very excited. Um, that was a very exciting presentation to me. And now I'm going to introduce to you uh, our next featured artist, who is Kai Oceans. And about Kai, Kai Oceans is a non-binary identified artist, speaker, business coach, and blogger specializing in spirituality, manifestation, business creation, and honoring who you are and your unique needs. Kai currently lives in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia building his artistic skills growing his spiritual practice and sharing his experiences on his blog. Follow your inner, on his blog, followyourinnerchild.com to inspire other creatives to build businesses around their quirks. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Kai Oceans. Hello everyone. My name is Kai as, um, Cassandra lovingly from my bio. And I'm an artist, um, a visual artist. I have one of my paintings right over there that I did a couple of years ago through acrylic. I'm also very into like business things and just learning how to, you know, translate any creative skill into like anything that can produce extra money and anything art related and spirituality and all. Oh, and all the things, all the things relating to like art, creativity and spirituality and like turn into like um, so a source of income. And today I wanted to talk, I guess more so on the artistic side of things and how to create a sustainable creative practice. Um, because what I'm learning in these past couple of um, years is how to sort of ground my creativity into something that I could do consistently and something that I can um, keep, you know, sort of um, keep up a practice routine that is easy to do. Because I feel like when you look um, upon social media and what have you, you hear a lot about all these intense um, creative practices of painters, of you know, drawing, painting, or whatever the case may be for like hours and hours. But I don't have that type of energy or that time to dedicate to that. So I've been learning ways to sort of like still have that level of practice in my life, like, you know, consistent practice, but also have it, I won't say um, dumbed down, but have it small bite sized enough for me to be able to do it consistently. So this is how to create a sustainable creative practice. <laughs> and I'll also have like some examples of like how to sort of um, map it out on like paper or in a bullet journal as far as like tracking the creative practice. So what is a creative practice? So thanks so my word. It is an intentional practice of creating, learning, mastering, and using the skills, craft, technical, artistic, intellectual, or creative that goes into our creative work. Um, it's also, you know, basically in layman's terms, just a sort of ritual of, you know, practicing your skills and art. You know, it's, it's as simple as that, but I got that off the internet so I can have like a technical term. So what does it mean to have a sustainable creative practice? Having a creative practice that can easily be done, that doesn't deplete your resources or energy, a way of fitting in that practice that honors your time, space, needs a unique lifestyle, whatever that might mean or look like for the creative person, while also bettering your skills in your craft. And that's the real difference between like a creative practice and a sustainable creative practice. You know, the sustainable part is the part where you get to create it in a way that is small enough for it to fit into your lifestyle. 
And I go into this more of why create a sustainable creative practice. So having hours of time to create practice and better your skills can be difficult for many reasons, from work, children, mental health, pet schedules, school, other hobbies, physical health, or neurodiversity. So being able to create a way of practicing that can be bite-sized enough to do consistently, but doesn't take up a lot of time or energy to do, can allow anyone to pursue a creative skill without it having to be a big time commitment. Also, it's small enough to start easily and to expand and improve on if you so desire. And that's pretty much the meat of all of this. I want to show people how I'm, I guess, using sort of like goal setting, intentionality, and um, habits, like creating habits to match my unique like lifestyle and the way my brain is organized and just you know how it can actually fit in with me instead of taking someone else's um, sort of creative practice or way of you know bettering these skills or habits and then forcing it into my life that doesn't really fit because of all sorts of reasons or simply I just don't have the energy to dedicate two hours you know to you know practice drawing and I'm not the only person um, that can learn that or that will be useful because as I said before, everyone has many reasons why they don't have the time or energy to, you know, have an hour, two hours, three hours plus to, you know, work on their art and craft. So as I'm learning how to do it, I wanna show other people how to do it as well. So what is the benefits of having a creative practice? You can develop your skills, engage in activity that improves your mental health, connect with a deeper part of yourself and your creativity. It gives you a break from everyday life in the Monday aspects of it. And you can trace and see improvement in your work. There's like infinite reasons of why, you know, just engaging in a creative like activity is beneficial. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can look up on the internet on like the thousands of benefits of, you know, engaging in like a creative activity or a creative practice. So let's get into the meat of this as far as how do you go about making a sustainable creative practice? And so your first step in um, creating a sustainable creative practice is your why. You know, why is it that you want to create a creative practice? And this is more so if you wanna do it in a more goal setting type of sort of angle, um, you can also just, it doesn't have to relate to a certain goal, but if you just wanna do or engage with your creative like activity every single day. You don't necessarily have to go as deep as I do into this. I'll have examples of a more pared down of just like, you know, tracking, you know, what you do in your creative practice every day and, you know, having that sort of um, structure in your life and something that's more akin to like goal setting and something a little bit more um, detailed in case you want to learn something specific. But, um, yeah, what is your why? Assuming that you're going to have like a goal of some sort of like, I want to improve my art or my craft in some way. Why do you want to um, do that? And this is important because you want that why to be easily accessible as you practice every day. So you're always reminded of that goal. And you sort of, you know, it keeps you on track with what you're doing and why you're doing it. And also, it's kind of like the same thing, but what do you want to achieve? as far as like, if there's a particular skill, as like if you're a painter, do you wanna learn color theory? You know, is that you wanna achieve? You know, if you wanna learn more about poses or anatomy, you know, what are specific things you wanna achieve within like, I guess your why or your overall sort of like art goal. So knowing what you want to reach for is more helpful. It provides more clarity to the artist and a great reference point when goal setting. Do you want to practice every day? Do you want to get on rusty? Do you want to add more create creativity in your life, et cetera, et cetera. And so what is it that you want to learn how to do? Is this more so if you're learning a certain creative skill that, you know, like art can be multi-pronged, like you can learn about painting and then with painting, you can learn again, color theory or um, maybe different types of canvases, different types of inks, different type of methods of painting or rendering aspects, you know, be as specific as you can so you don't get sidetracked with all the options of what you can do. It will also help you get to the real tangible, tan, tangible 
result than a vague one that can take a lot longer to achieve or it's hard to see in real time. So the more specific that you can be as far as what you actually want to improve on, the easier it is to set a, a creative practice around it and also to see actual tangible improvement. Because again, if you're actually wanting to improve something specific, it's it's a better a better way to keep track of it is having it have the result be a tangible one. So if you want to again improve um, the way you work with color in painting, you know, you can say, I want to learn more about color theory. You can go in there further and say, I'm not really good with colors, green, blue, purple, like those cool colors. So you can be like, I want to work with these colors, learn more about them, paint more with them so I can be more practiced at them. And so that's an easier way to sort of track and see a tangible result of not being as good in those uh, cool tone blue colors, green colors, and seeing you approving them instead of saying, I just want to get better with color. So here's more of the sort of technical structured thing is what's the bare minimum amount of time you can give? And this is where the sustainable part comes in. Decide how much time you want to start out with. Even 10 minutes of focus work will, comp will compound over time. And that's really the big essence of creating a sustainable creative practice is how much time do you want to give to this? And it's not about hours. <laughs> It's literally about minutes. Me personally, when I was like really like on top of this, I dedicated 25 minutes, 25 minutes each day on drawing poses and other different things. I'll show you sort of like the way I written out um, my sort of creative practice thing. But for me, it was 25 minutes because it was short enough that I can fit it in at any point of time in my day. It was also long enough for me to like be focused and engaged in something. And it was also short enough that if I had more energy or if I was really into what I was drawing, I can expand it more. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a certain number. It's all about what you are able to do and make sure it's something that you can, you know, easily commit to. It's about making this easy, making the barrier of entry easy and accessible, not trying to create something perfect from the outside or something that you should be doing because you're an artist or a dancer or whatever. And this, this is what these, these creative people do to achieve you know, mastery. It's not about that, it's more about what you can actually do because if you can't commit to it, then it's gonna be much harder to achieve your creative goals. But if you make it easy, it's like a guarantee at that point because you're constantly doing it, even if it's small little bite size versus doing it, you know, perfectly or in a longer form, but it's very um, inconsistent. So the next part of this is break down what you will break down what it would take to get there. So let's go back to like I want to learn more about um, painting cool cooler colors. Um, more impressively, you know, if there's a certain skill level project or goal you want to achieve in your craft, break down the different steps and or technical skills you would have to learn to get there. So we want to learn how to paint, you know, the, the blues, the greens and the purples um, a lot better. What, break that down for more. Do you need to read a books on color theory or those types of colors? Are there other artists that are really good in those kind of colors that you can look at their live streams and see how they use those colors? You know, are there materials that you can buy that can help you with, you know, rendering those colors? You know, think more, you know, break these things down to very easy steps that you can do. So again, with these baby steps, you're improving that overall goal of learning these certain colors or learning color theory a lot easier. And this is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> Use trackers to show progress and accountability. If you can easily, if you can easily lose track of where you are in a certain project, progress or goal, having trackers can help you stay on top of where you are. You can have a visual re representation of your progress you are doing in an easy point of reference if you somehow fall out of your routine. This has been like 
so helpful for me in just all areas of my life because I can lose track of what I'm doing very easily, especially if it's something that, you know, like art or something that isn't a part of my everyday. I can, you know, be into a certain project, but then two days pass and I come back to it and I kind of don't know where to sort of like pick up at because I just, you know, out of sight, out of mind type of um, mindset that I have. But having like a tracker and um, just like a, a book, uh, like a bullet journal, and I can log my progress of where I am on a certain project helps so much because I can go back to it and say, oh, I was, you know, uh, drawing the arm or shading the arm. So now it's like, okay, I can pick up where I left off easier if I lose track. And also with trackers, it's a great visual way to see how you are making progress every day. Because, you know, even though this is like a lot of information, um, what you're actually doing isn't that intense. So it might not feel like you're really learning that much. But as you see it visually, the, the, the way you're filling in the, the squares or however you're tracking your progress, you can see how every day that progress is sort of adding up over time because it's hard to do that when you're not tracking it because, you know, we're surrounded by so much information and content all the time. So, you know, I feel like it's essential to have some type of way to track your progress and to see it visually. So you, you know the work that you're putting in every day or however, um, whatever schedule you sort of have set up for yourself. And also the accountability is really good too. Especially if you're not like really into having an accountability buddy and that type of thing, you, that's a, a, having the trackers and things of that nature is a good way to keep accountability on yourself. And so start where you are. So in this whole process, of you know creating sustainable practice and you're kind of like overwhelmed by it or you don't know where to start it's just great to start where you are if you don't have like a super specific goal or you don't know which type of super specific goal um you want to go after it's okay to simply start from where you are you know if you're overwhelmed and it's okay to simply start from where you are if you're overwhelmed with what you can do the point is to simply create a routine you can stick to then achieve a specific goal. So again, if you want it to be more like a goal setting thing, sure, be specific, but if you don't know how to be specific in that goal, just start from where you are. And if you just wanna, again, just do something every day, then it's as simple as, you know, having a, a, a simple tracker and setting a time and, you know, sticking to that time and actually doing it and just tracking your progress. Here's another important point in creating a sustainable practice is shoot for consistency, not perfection. Having a sustainable creative practice is about making consistent progress easy, not doing your practice, not doing your practice perfectly. You achieve better results faster and longer with consistency than doing something perfect once in a while. And this is because of the count, the compound um, effect. And this is from this is actually a book from, let me go down, Darren Hardy. Um, the book is also called The, Com the Compound Effect. And with the count, count, compound effect is a strategy of reaping huge rewards from small, seemingly insignificant actions. And his little formula is small choices plus consistency plus time equals significant results. So, in lamest terms, it's just baby steps and consistent baby steps. Because it's like if you want to walk from your home to, I don't know, some type of event, <laughs> like two miles away, you're not much of a walker. Instead of thinking of, I got to walk two miles to get to where I need to go, it's better to think of it walking, I don't know, a quarter of a mile or just breaking that down to like, let me just think about going like, like the first, uh, uh, first fourth of there, like one fourth there. And then once you get there, then you think about walking, you know, that extra fourth and then the next one, then the next one, then you get there. It just gives your brain a break of thinking of all the details and the how to's and how things are gonna work out because that's when we usually get stuck with all of this anyway. 
It's like, how is it going to happen? How am I going to do it? Do I, enough, do I have enough time? Do I have enough resources? I have this to do. I have that to do. Yada, yada, yada. But if you break it down to just, again, like small, doable pieces, your brain won't go into overdrive trying to make everything work because you don't actually have to make everything work. You just have to, you know, find a way to make it fit into your unique life. And then honestly, once you start getting more consistent, you will probably find other ways to build that out if you so choose or keep it the same. Either way, it's about winning the consistency game than the, the perfectionist game or, you know, doing things the right way, because it doesn't matter if you do it the right way. If you're not consistent, you won't reap those rewards or see improvement, you know, over time because you're inconsistent and you're losing track and it's kind of hard to keep up with something if there's no consistency built into, you know, that practice that you're doing. Here's some like extra points before I get into my examples is, Create different practices for different energy levels. And what I've learned over the years, being a neurodivergent person, is that my energy can be high one day, my energy can be low the next day. Right now, I'm in a very like low energy sort of like era. So my energy is pretty low on a consistent basis. So instead of trying to make uh, I guess going to use this example, like exercise, I like to run, but sometimes running is just too much for me to do. So instead I'll do like a, um, a fast paced walk. That's a, a low enough, you know, barrier of entry that I can do that even when I don't really feel like running. You know, it's something that I can think about or it's something that, you know, when I wake up and if I'm am a little bit groggy and more tired than I want to be, it's still something that, oh, I can still do this because, you know, running at a fast pace won't exhaust me completely or I'm not thinking about how tired I will be or how my legs is gonna hurt when I'm running because I'm just doing a fast paced walk. And if I don't feel like doing a fast paced walk, I might do yoga or do weights because I like doing the weights and it's something that it's just easier for me to do, you know, and, and think about in the morning than like running for like 20 minutes. So let's see, it might be helpful to set up different types of practice to adjust for different energy levels. Maybe on low level days, you only practice for 10 or 15 minutes. And on days where your energy is higher or you have the time, you can adjust the difficulty or the time you practice. Listen to your body and never feel guilty for not doing enough. Cutting your time short or simply skipping a day is okay. And I've done that a lot in my um, own creative practice. Like I say like 90% of the time, I'm able to you know, practice for a full 25 minutes. But some days I feel so wiped out or exhausted or even just the practice I'm doing is just sending me into overwhelm. And it's just like, I got to cut it short. And it's a good thing I do that because I don't completely burn out or get so angry that it kind of interrupts my ability to keep doing the practice. You know, once I just say, hey, I feel like my body is saying, I, I just can't do it right now. It's like, great. We did what we need to do. We showed up. We did it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and, and we're done. And we just leave it there and have the next day be completely fresh and new. And so the next uh, and probably like the last point before I show my own personal uh, sustainable creative practice is mix up, mix it up if you need to keep it fresh. If you get bored easily, Incorporate different things to practice or anything that will keep your creative practice fun and inviting experience. I get bored easily. So like every week or two, I would switch up what I practice on. Like um, I would practice anatomy one day, then poses specifically the next um, week or eyes for two weeks. I really like drawing eyes and then I'll switch it up to like clothes. So whatever you need to do to keep it fresh, whether it's that practice or maybe the location that you're practicing or just whatever part of the process, you know, incorporate that. Because again, this is all about making it fit you and your lifestyle and your personality. So, you know, don't be afraid to, again, mix it up to keep it fresh so you're able to do it for um, a longer period of time. So now I'm going to show you just like a blank version of how to put all of this information I just told you into like onto paper. Share the screen. Damn. Yes, here we go. 
So as you can see, I just made this like this morning. So I'm sorry, it's not like aesthetically pleasing in any uh, sort of way. So this is like where you put your creative goal. Again, like if I want to learn about um, color theory or the, the blues and the green colors, it's like I want to improve, you know, color theory. Why you want to reach your goal? I want to reach that goal because I want to more effectively render colors properly so they can look more realistic to the still life I'm creating. And also I'm very weak at these colors and I just really want to improve on them, you know, have your goal right there. And then you can have that sort of Tom bound um, aspect to it if you want to, and you say you'll reach your goal by, I put an example, December 26th this year. Um, you can have that there or not, it's whatever. And so these are, he, the next thing you will put down is the list of three things you need to be able to reach your, you know, your goal of, you know, learning how to render better with these, you know, blue and green colors. So the first thing is like, you know, uh, uh, finding resources around um, these blue and, 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 and cooler colors. That could be one thing. The second thing is like, you know, materials or maybe techniques you can learn. Um, that can be one uh, thing that can help you achieve that goal. And the third thing is like actually practicing. Maybe you'll practice, you know, for 25 minutes a day using these colors and um, to help have that sort of practical, you know, in the present practice of using those colors so you can, you know, actually learn how to do them. And so it's like you use these and you break it down into daily tasks. And so if the first thing is just like um, gathering resources around color theory, you can be like, okay, the, the first dot is just, you know, finding resources on color theory or finding resources on how to paint with cooler colors. And then um, you have your tracker. I just use squares because it's simple and easy. You can look up all different kinds of trackers online, but if you're going to do this for like a week or so, you put like seven days and each day that you look up, you know, color theory or cooler colors for, you know, 25 minutes or however long you want to do it, you fill it in. And then the next day you do the same thing, fill it in. And it's such and such a, and then like you're done that part. And then you can do it again with, I forgot what the second thing um, my uh, uh, um, thing was, oh, like different processes or materials. You can then list you know, finding different materials. And then you have the progress tracker of like, each time you look for different materials or different ways to use materials to get the result that you want when it comes to color theory or cooler colors. And you fill it in every time you do that, every 25 minutes, however long you want, and et cetera, et cetera. And you just keep kind of doing that until you get, you reach to your goal or, you know, by whatever time you kind of look back on your work and what you've done and see the improvement. And then you do it all over again, because you know, for, you know, works of progress. So I will show you my own. Um, this is actually a more pared down version. So if you just want a pared down version, you don't want like a goal tracking type of thing. Um, one easy one is like my drawing tasks. And so I get clothing uh, references because I want to learn how to draw clothes better. And then the second point is practice clothing for two weeks for 25 minutes. Then here's the tracker to um, show that sort of progress um, for two weeks. And then the next one is get hair references. And then I practice that for two weeks for 25 minutes and I references, shoe references, and it's like the same sort of like two week things for 25 minutes. And then the last one is like the goal setting one. So I um, blurred out some parts, so it's kind of like personal, but it's like basically learn how to draw a comic. And my why is, I want to learn how to draw comics so I can like put my daydreams that I have, you know, into, into real life. And then I had my time bound aspect, which is, you know, by six months, I will make a 10 page manga of one of my daydreams. And so I broke that sort of a uh, goal down of when I draw comics on what do I need to do to achieve that? So I need to learn how to draw better. I need to learn how to create a story and actually drawing the manga. And so under the draw better, I have like drawing different poses, um, anatomy stuff, things of that nature. And then with creating the story, I had down like learning 
plot points and things around creating a story. And with drawing a manga, it could be like paneling, lettering, you know, how to draw certain aspects of like comic books and things of that nature. That sort of breaking down of the things that you broke down to get to the overall goal of, I want to be able to draw um, comics of my daydreams. And so I put all of that information here into daily tasks. So I would get 90 mail poses and put it in my Dropbox so I can easily access them. Mm -hmm. And I would draw those mail poses for 30 days for 25 minutes at least. And so I did that because I filled all this in and it was very you know, effective. And I did that for my two other um, how to draw better aspects of my goal. And I filled them in and you see it's like, you know, some gaps here, but some of them colored in. But the reason that I was able to even like be able to do it is because I made it so easy and I made it, you know, I adapted to my lifestyle and with some, most of the time I do it in the mornings, but again, it's only 25 minutes at least. So I can do it in the afternoon if I don't have the morning, I can do it in the evening if I'm not able to do it any other time or fuck it, I just feel lazy. So, you know, <laughs> honesty hour i'm like learn i'm in the process of learning all this this is from like damn near a year ago but you know this was like my first time actually doing sort of like a goal planning thing like i looked at other so goal planning things for a good while and didn't make this and i found it works for me so i'm happy to share that with everyone else out in the world who's creative and you know need something a little more solid that they can um use to kind of get to their creative goals. And I know I've talked a lot and it's really fast, but I hope this was helpful. Um, thank you, Cassandra, for again, letting me you know, speak here and I will talk to you all tomorrow. <laughs> thank you, Kai, so much for your presentation. It was really refreshing to see um, your own ha actual handwriting and to see what your journal looks like and to know I've known you for a long time and I've seen your progress and it's just very nice to see. And so I really appreciate you sharing your experience with us and your tips. So I'm going to introduce uh, Glynis now. Our next featured artist um, is Glynis Reed. And I'm going to introduce her. And there it is right there on my phone. Glynis Reed has exhibited her artwork extensively at the local, national, and international levels. A solo exhibition of her art was featured at the Kunstraum Arcade Gallery in Medling, Austria. Her work has also been on the view, on view at the DePaul University Museum in Chicago, Illinois, the African American Museum of Philadelphia, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, California, Craft and Folk Art Museum in Los Angeles, the Noyes Museum of Arts in Oceanville, New Jersey, Allen's Lane Art Center in Philadelphia, Richard Stockton University Art Gallery in Pomona, Asian Arts Initiative Philadelphia, the Laguna Art Museum in Laguna Beach, California, and numerous other exhibition spaces. She is a recipient of the Visions from New California Award she holds an MFA in studio art from the University of California, Irvine. She is currently a dual title PhD candidate in art education and women's gender and sexuality studies at the University of, uh, at the Pennsylvania State University. Reed authored the young adult book, James Baldwin, novelist and critic, and is a co-editor of the forthcoming bio, forthcoming volume, BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, I know P-O-C is People of Color, um, Alliances, Building Community and Curricula. You may view her artwork on her website, glynisreed.com. That's G-L-Y-N-N-I-S, glynisreed, R-E-E-D.com. Please welcome Glynis Reed. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Cassandra, um, I really appreciate you inviting me to this wonderful festival to feature Black women's voices and visual arts. 
and um, and performing arts. And um, the talk that I'll be giving today is on uh, an artist series that I have called The Beheld Beings. So my paper is titled The Beheld Beings, an artistic practice embodying affect and the abject. So are you hearing me okay? Yeah, okay. So I'll go ahead and share my PowerPoint with images of my work. And you're able to see that too? Thumbs up? <laughs> okay. Um, not long after I moved into my dream home, eight years ago, the first home of my own, I began to better understand the multiple ways that spirit speaks to me. By increments, I have embraced the polyphonic experience of faith. For years, I sought a sense of connection to spirit's unseen realms. I wanted a coherent understanding of where I stood in the world. I found that I danced around a shifting divide in myself between my complex and what felt like complicated identity. As I moved out of my parents' house, I began transitioning away from attending the seemingly progressive Shore Fellowship Christian Church that for three years strong felt like a good answer to my need for guidance in my spiritual path. While releasing myself from involvement with Shore Fellowship Church, I grew more in touch with another dimension of my spirituality. I rediscovered many of my belongings that had been buried in storage after moving into my new home. I found artwork created in my early years as an undergraduate art student, fabric collages, paintings on canvas, mixed media pieces, and photographs. When I created these works, my connection to non-Western spiritual tradition surfaced, making elegant spiritual realities visible through my artistic explorations. I was a, I was a budding devotee to Oshu and Nyamaya as an undergraduate, two African goddesses from the Orisha pantheon of the West African Ifa religion. These goddesses of the river and the ocean, respectively, were major creative focal points for me back then. These deities have been with me throughout my adult life and certainly before that too. It was later in life that I saw how the ancestors, Oshun, Yomaya, and the other Rishas came to shape, presenting themselves to my conscious awareness through my art. As I sat in the light that beamed through the windows of my sparsely furnished new home, I studied the paintings, collages, photographs, and drawings that I hung on the wall are laid out on a table to surround me. I could no longer contain the presence of my African-rooted spirituality under the rubric of Christianity. Thanks to Shore Fellowship, I struggled with and rejected myself, not only due to my sexual orientation, but also because of the spiritual beliefs that would not allow me to squeeze into the mold of a good Christian woman, fit to be married and domestically trained and tamed. After all, I was a queer Black woman, an artist, a deviant, a lover of the Orishas, someone who just does not seem to fit. But I found that I do fit my own name. I fit my own definition. I understand the labels of queer, Black woman, artist, child of Orisha, and more that I claim. I am the one that defines my own reality and the one that seeks truth for myself. I have been in the closets of my spiritual orientation and in the struggle to come out and articulate my own voice. My spirit is in a synthesis of multiple realities. Every piece of me is valuable as I seek oneness in my personal spiritual practice. I have come to understand that my spirit knows no border, no face, no voice, style, or color. I have learned to grow against the grain. I am in love with these variegated passages in my life and brandish with pride the ability to thrive in both daylight and night. Long after my last days attending Shore Fellowship Church, I found myself yearning to connect with the Orisha community again. In my 30s, I used to attend an Ifa study class in the Los Angeles Black Arts neighborhood of Lamert Park. 
The Baba Lao of the temple had written well-respected books on the tradition and was an incredible storehouse of knowledge. I learned a lot there that expanded the information I gathered from books and started to have some practical experience in the tradition. When I, <clears throat> when I moved away from Los Angeles to live with my parents in New Jersey in 2010, it seemed like my connections to the Orisha community were so far away. My father is Christian and perhaps it was inevitable that I would wind up worshiping at a church like Shore Fellowship under the influence of living in his household. I attended that church and tried to make it work, but eventually the pressure of my authentic nature as a queer black woman and someone whose heart was deeply connected to African diaspora religion kept bubbling up and I could not tolerate going to that church anymore. I lived in New Jersey for 10 years before I got my footing and connected with another Ifa temple. The woman who became my wife introduced me to someone who introduced me to someone and I was finally able to, be, to move forward in my spiritual growth in the Ifa faith. I am now part an, of an Ifa community based in Delaware. The journey to this point has been a long one and I am grateful to have the support of my ancestors in Orisha in order to make my way through the challenges of this life. My art, since my undergraduate days, has been an Im immense repository for spirit and a great resource of information gleaned intuitively. It seems as though art has been the measuring stick of my connectivity to otherworldly realities. The reverie of making art or the contemplation and feeling involved with it has been a persistently powerful ex experience for me. When I create, I can gaze into the imagery that I produce and see myself and sense the influence of something just beyond myself. Perhaps guardian spirits holding my hand, dancing with me in the creative process. My studio is a room that becomes a womb for the visualizing of what could not be wholly communicated otherwise. There is something tangibly different about working on art pieces that retain the traces of the hand and the gestures of the body. I had sustained a photographic art practice that centered on digital collage for ne nearly 20 years prior to working on my artworks, The, the Beheld Beings. In this series of drawings, I explored the dematerialization of physical form through portraits overlaid with plant imagery and landscape scenes that prominently featured, feature palm trees. I am an interdisciplinary artist and I have been creating mixed media pieces in the mediums of photography and drawing in my recent work for a few years. Digital photo collages are the basis for my artworks and begin with recognizable imagery of faces or landscapes that become abstract through digital editing. The images start to dissolve and take on new forms as I add and subtract gestural lines and layer stippled dots on top of the photos with color black and white India ink brush pens. I seek to foreground the overwrought emotional quality of the drawings that simultaneously convey a sense of the abject and an African-centered spirituality. A number of these images are portraits of women shrouded in mystery, their faces seemingly decomposing, dematerializing, yet formed by an infinitude of emotionally charged and carefully drawn marks. The moods conveyed by the portraits are dark and complex. I highlight the influence of Haitian Vodou in the work as the palm leaf is a meaningful symbol in that tradition. The palm leaf is associated with the Loa Azan, known as a healer and protector, whose devotees might be seen in ritual wearing a mask of palm leaves. The imagery of some of the women in the photo drawings reflect reflects hybridity that seems part human, part animal, part plant life. Several of the portraits I've created feature women with palm leaves growing out of their scalp. At times, the leaves cover large parts of their faces. My work is very much about channeling embodied spirit and reaching into the void and the depths to create something meaningful. These portraits circumscribe my experience, channeling dark thoughts, ambivalent moods, chaos, excess, and fear. Because some of the artwork comes from darker places in me, I say that it reflects aspects of the abject. It reflects terror and hauntings, pain and despair, as well as beauty, strength, and power. 
In Becoming Human, Zakia Iman Jackson's concept of plasticity, quote, maintains that Blackened people are not so much as dehumanized as non-humans, are cast as liminal humans, nor are Blackened people framed as animal-like or machine-like, but are cast as sub, supra, and human simultaneously and in a manner that puts being in peril because the operations of simultaneously being everything and nothing for an order, human, animal, machine, for instance, constructs Black and humanity as the privation and exorbitance of form, end quote. My depiction of bodies that are whole but seeming, seemingly disintegrating visually represents Jackson's plasticity of Blackness theory that the slave be everything, quote, everything and nothing at the register of ontology such that form cannot, shall not hold, end quote. It was my intention for the portraits to maintain a state of suspension where they are formed from dissolving and congealing molecules at once. Jackson's notion of plasticity places my image making in this series in, in, a continuum, in a continuum of ideas around the formation of the Black subject projected literally upon my representation of the Black body. I am interested in the idea of Odu as a decolonial system of faith. Knowing that African diaspora religions have historically been subject to suppression by colonizing forces, yet have survived even through the transatlantic slave trade, speaks to the power encompassed by these traditions. The art historian Robert Ferris Thompson asserts in his classic text, Flash of the Spirit, quote, the Yoruba remain the Yoruba precisely because their culture provides them with ample philosophic means for comprehending and ultimately transcending the powers that periodically threaten to dissolve them. That their religion and their art withstood the horrors of the Middle Passage and firmly established themselves in the Americas. New York City, Miami, Havana, Matanzas, Bahia, Rio de, Rio de Janeiro, as the slave trade affected a Yorba diaspora reflects the triumph of an exorable communal will. The drawings also reflect and evoke spiritual survival and mirror the journey of African ancestors through this splintered maze of life created in the new world. I found spirits visiting me in the anxious evenings, our day spent drawing out the faces of unknown beings from the sparsely printed images on Epson digital photo paper. When I work on these drawings, I get absorbed in the process. I feel as though I'm trying to discover who the woman is that, is that I'm revealing to myself in the action of drawing. I lose time as I work, hours pass, and still find the eyes of crowned head looking at me. The experience of time in the studio becomes akin to Tinsley's idea of spirit work. Spirit work does not conform to the dictates of human time. Time becomes a moment, an instant experience in the now, but also a space crammed with moments of wisdom about an event or a series of events already having inhabited different moments are with the intention of inhabiting them while all occurring simultaneously in this instance. In this space, as well as in other instances and spaces of which we are not immediately aware. At times I felt compelled to stay with the drawings, to keep working them, to reveal the image of a face that faintly resembled my own. A lovely and mysterious look that I chased across the page until it was finally clear that the female spirit had arrived and the drawing was done after weeks of working. Eventually I hung the portrait next to my bedside and felt I often caught her, whoever she is, glancing at me, speaking to me wordlessly through spirit. When drawing, I feel present with the work and in a sense of flow. Wolf Woman came months before Crowned Head. It is the largest portrait in the series at 24 inches by 24 inches. And I created, created it at a time of great emotional turmoil. The entire artwork is powerfully invested with strong emotional affect. I had already been practicing my mark making on some landscape pieces and another digital collage portrait. But as Wolf Woman came into being, I preserved the sadness of her eyes while I built up heavy black marks with the India ink pen and layered white lines 
and dots on the portrait with a whiteout pen. This method led to me finding and using white India ink brush pens, which I utilized on the other, other pictures in the, in the series. The black marks compose not only the density of the face, but I also use cross hatching to build up a black haze surrounding the figure's head and shoulders. The tightly pursed mouth and eyes looking at the viewer from the side express the intensity of the mood of this character. The nose of the figure seems to disappear into a whirlpool of spiraling marks. Her head is covered by palm tree leaves that also seem to echo the texture of feathers. She is already hybrid with palm leaves seeming to grow out of her head, but this black figure appears to hover on the edge of animality. Zakia Iman Jackson asserts, quote, gender and sexuality feature prominently in animalizing discourse as a measure of both the quality of the mind and an index of spirit. Gendered and sexual discourses on the, quote, African are inextricable from those pertaining to reason, historicity, and civilization, as purported observations of gender and sexuality were frequently used to provide evidence of the inherent abject quality of Black people's human animality from the earliest days of the invention of the human, end quote. Wolf Woman evokes that sense of abjection and animality suggested by Jackson and possesses a feeling of chaos and despair at the same time. In surfacing, a black female figure appears to gaze at the viewer from just below the surface of water. The black marks that cover the photographic image convey a feeling of rippling black water. The water spirit Ezeli seems to peer out from the boundary between her and the viewer. She ominously ho hovers between spirit and embodiment. Jackie Alexander in her book, Pedagogy Gojis of Crossing says this about the distinction between the body and spirit. Quote, the purpose of the body is to act, not simply though importantly as an encasement of the soul, but also as a medium of spirit, the repository of a consciousness that derives from a source residing elsewhere, another ceremonial ritual marking. To this end, embodiment functions as a pathway to knowledge, a talking book whose intelligibility relies on the social, the spiritual expertise of a community to decode sacred knowledge, since it's inc inconceivable to think about the Lawa or Orisha descending without a message to the collectivity gathered in their presence. Since body is not body alone, but rather one element of the, in the triad of mind, body, and spirit. What we need to understand is how such embodiment provides the moorings for a subjectivity that knits together these very elements. How is a sacred interior cultivated and how does it assist practitioners in the task of making themselves intelligible to themselves? Close quote. The water that the spirit in surfacing is immersed in echoes the waters of the Nile Passage and the African captives who chose to jump overboard rather than risk the voyage to an unknown hell. I imagine this being in surfacing to be a protector or guide for the captives who lost their lives in the journey. Tinsley writes on the different embodiments of Esli in her book, Esli's Mirrors, Imagining Black Queer Genders. Esli's Je Wouge are translated from Haitian Creole to English as Esli Red Eyes, is a fierce aspect of the goddess who arrives at ceremonies in anguish and pain with eyes red with rage and tears. Tinsley writes, quote, when Jay Woosh comes and digs her nails into your flesh, it's not senselessly. It's to bring you into consciousness of other realms, realms where the Black woman transforms pain to her own uses, power, and pleasure. You have to be jolted out of comfort, normality, and impunity to go there, close quote. In this body of work, my collection of beheld beings, I experience consciousness of other realms and transmute my pain and trauma through the creative process. Artistic activity becomes the ground where I'm able to use pain for my own power and pleasure. In the process, I am working in the stream of spiritual energy that has dislodged my sense of comfort, normality, and impunity. The last drawing completed thus far in the series, The Leaves Shroud Her Face, is the most abstract of all the artworks. You cannot easily identify the eyes of the figure as you are able to in the other drawings. There are embellishments at the mouth and chin which re resemble fur or hair, bringing the hybridity of the portrait back to an animalistic reference. The portrait also possesses qualities of the abject in its large masses of black stroked lines and fearsome expression. 
Chris Deva wrote a book link essay on the, on the abject called Powers of Horror. I call from that essay to describe more fully the aspects of the abject in the leaves shot her face and the series as a whole. Quote, if it be true that the abject simultaneously beseeches and polarizes the subject, one can understand that it is experienced at the peak of its strength when that subject, weary of fruitless attempts to identify with something on the outside, finds the impossible within. When it finds that the impossible constitutes its very being, that it is nothing other than abject. The abjection of self would be the culminating form of that experience of the subject to which it's revealed that all its objects are based merely on the inaugural loss that lay the foundations of its own being. There's nothing like the abjection of self to show that all abjection is in fact recognition of the want on which any being, meaning, language, or desire is founded. Close quote. Additionally, the leaf shout her face is based on a digital collage portrait of myself that had been highly abstracted. I created much of the drawing intuitively in response to the minimal marks in the print and my own effective experience at the time. It's significant that the image is based on a portrait of myself as Kristeva writes about the subject that finds the impossible within and its being is, quote, none other than abject, end close quote. Marquise Bay in anarcho-blackness expresses the idea of the impossible being as well, which gets translated as non-persons and no ones, and figures nicely as a summary of the series, The Behold Beings as a Whole. Near the end of his book, he writes, we seek to allow others and non-persons and unpeople and impossible people and no ones, and those of us living by normative subjectivities because we believe they were all we had to live. What we are cannot be fixed, we are becoming. The beheld beings as a series of images are becoming, they are not fixed. So I just have two more pages, um, should I continue? The spirit work I invoke in the beheld beings is a mean of making spirit visible and actualized while in a state of constant transformation and becoming. This process of creative meditation makes up a practice of spiritual healing and recovery from intrusions such as racism and sexual violence. Alexander speaks on the, of the Orishas Oya and Yemaya as protectors of their children. Oya is very protective. She protects with a ferocity. I did not know how to do battle. I had to learn to sit with her and tell her what was going on. She acts with a swiftness that is amazing. Oya gave me life. She, she is the reason I'm on this planet. She made it possible for me to breathe. Oya will call upon Yamaya to help her children. The dead are in the ocean and the dead are also in the air. Oya teaches us to know the dance of life, close quote. When it comes to Haitian Lawas, it's well known that they were invoked to help the Black Haitians in their fight for, to gain independence from the French. Spirit work is something that operates on an individual and collective level. The reverence of Black people for their ancestors Orisha, Loa, and other African spirits has been a vital way that Black people have been able to survive in the new world, even to this day. Tinsley expresses about Ezeli Danto, one of the paths of Ezeli, quote, dark skin, hardworking, woman-loving Danto's power to start a revolution came from her position standing firm on what Sylvia Winter terms demonic ground. Drawing on the language of Shakespeare's The Tempest, Winter theorizes demonic ground as the conceptual space assigned to enlightened man's sexual racial other, the black woman, whose rational non-demonic, I'm sorry, non-demonic self-expression cannot even be imagined because such a radically different way of understanding the world would explode the master's discourse. Despite a spiritual practice and worldview that is considered demonic or abject by many, Tinsley asserts that the Black woman voodoo practitioner has the capacity to radically disrupt the master narrative, perhaps because it relies on a set of codes that are so radically different from the Western mainstream Christian perspective. The fact that Black people throughout the diaspora have held on to and even cultivated resistant spiritual practices as a means, as a means of worship and survival speaks to the powerfully resilient culture of people of African descent. It's my intention to align my artwork with these histories of survival and the spiritual practice that have allowed African diasporic people to thrive under circumstances of extreme containment and, pre and pressure. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gwyneth. It was really um, entertaining. It was really interesting listening to uh, what uh, there were some similar themes between your work and Tamara's work, right? Like similar, the Haitian stuff. So um, yeah, that's that was really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being here. I loved it. Oh, yep. That was me saying that really brought my spirit and my soul and my heart and every cell in my body tremendous joy and appreciation. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to connecting with you in the future. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Looking forward to your presentation as well. Oh, do you know what I forgot? Not, oh, um, Gina, I forgot to ask for folks' links to be put up on the screen. I just completely forgot to ask that. Is there still time for that? For those that are coming forward? They are in the YouTube chat. Oh, neat. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, what made me think of that is, oh, said that Oh, wanted to get in touch with Glennis and I was thinking about, oh, oh no, links, links on the screen. So that's what made me think of that. But um, yeah, that was very, very, um, I was gonna say a very striking presentation, but striking is violent apparently. <laughs> oh, the language. I'm getting ready to introduce you. Oh, you look like you are more than Retai. To address environmental and social justice issues, O has made health and well being their life's purpose. S slash he has worked for over 25 years as a practitioner and educator in the areas of body work, self care, special, social services, and health care support. S slash he is a seasoned presenter and leads workshops for individuals and groups to support healing our society's legacies of racism, sexism, homophobia, and class privilege in order to build healthier and stronger relationships and organizations. Drawing on their Quaker values rooted in love, peace, and social justice, O's practice embraces a trauma-informed healing justice approach to community organizing in support of social and environmental justice. O is a staff member and spiritual midwife of Philly Thrive, a Philadelphia-based environmental justice organization focused on improving the health and well-being of the city's residents and supporting a cleaner, healthier future. S slash H is a founding member of Alternatives to Gun Violence, a community healing collaborative committed to social justice in the Philadelphia area. A longtime Quaker, O is an alchemist of love and respect transform, a ministry that focuses on deepening our understanding and experience of alternatives to social and environmental violence by exploring the transforming power of love. You can visit her at www.leeway.org slash artists slash O. Please welcome O. So. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me? I'm imagining you can now. Yeah. Yeah. I see a thumbs up. Wonderful. Okay, so um, uh, yes, wonderful. Many thumbs up now, excellent. So um, first, obviously, thank you, thank you, thank you for open doors because often doors appear to be um, cemented shut for many women of color. And so to have women, uh, people of color, supporting people of color is truly a part of the transformation of uh, the healing work that is so necessary at this time. 
So I'm um, feeling a little tender around offering this. And so here we go. Let's be vulnerable. I'm going to step in some major forms of vulnerability here. Uh, pushing technical buttons. Let's see what we got. Okay, looks like that button worked. Now let's see what we have. Okay. So what I would like to do is invite everyone to breathe actually. Um, a large part of the practice that I live into, I dream into, I dance into, is about inviting people to reclaim our birthright of breathing. In the past, I used to share with people, um, you can live months without food, you can live a couple of weeks without water, but you can't live too long without breathing. And that really is indicative to how powerful breath really is. And so um, I would like to invite us to breathe, ah, to maybe make some sounds, ah, and to stretch. You may want to stretch a little bit, turning to your right, a little bit turning to your left, ah. And remember that wherever we go, as we are doing this work for spirit, we go with our bodies. And it's important um, to make sure that we are tending to our bodies uh, in a culture that is so committed to us self-destructing, self-annihilating. So here we go. An invitation to my world, be it real or imagined. Inviting a, us again to breathe. allowing us to feel the sensuality of our breath. And the mystical powers that also exist within our breathing. Mother's womb was my protection. Billions and billions and billions turned into trillions of years protected in the womb of mother. Homeland. A homeland of the ancient wisdom tenders. Not wisdom keepers but wisdom tenders, healers, the resources of life, remembered. Literally, I literally mean that, literally to re, like to reimagine, to remember. Reimagine to remember literally. Member. Members brought back together again and again and again and again and again. Members brought back together again. And again. And again. Mother's portal. Mother's womb. I invite you to breathe. I invite you to feel the antiquity and the sensuality and the power of your breath. Ah. 
my mother's womb, <laughs> somewhat distinct from mother's womb, my mother's womb. was where I engaged and learned. I learned to track and follow. In my mother's womb, I was engaged and I learned to track and follow a multitude. And I mean a multitude. <laughs> I really mean a multitude of pathways to life's promised land. You see, it was in my mother's womb that I had been taught about this land, this land. Later, I would ta be taught to call earth. And? Lean, to actually lean into the rhythms, to lean into, <laughs> yes, to lean into the rhythms that would bring me to the rhythms that would bring me to remembering. Remembering the ways of deep, transformative, loving. In her womb, I remembered life's promised land, a land we would call Earth. I invite you to breathe. I invite you to breathe as if your breath belongs to you and only you. I invite you. <laughs> to breathe as if it is your birthright. It was in my mother's womb, in my mother's womb, that I learned about the generosity of God's transformative power. a power we have all experienced, if but only once. This specific form of power later, as I incarnated, as we incarnated, someone would point and teach and offer this concept, this vibration, this word often misused called love. I invite you to breathe. I invite you to breathe as if your life depends on it, because it does. Within my mother's womb, I found protection. I may have been one of the protected seven billion and growing. Within my mother's womb, I found protection that I may find my way back. 
that I may find my way back to you. That we may embrace and find ourselves re-entering into a divine holiness. And together, actually it can only be done together, enter into our collective holiness. Mother's womb was protection. I invite you to breathe. My homeland of the ancient wisdom. The ancient wisdom tenders my healers. the resource of life remembered. My mother's womb was where I learned, I learned the pathways to life's promised land. That we call earth. And the rhythms that would bring me, the rhythms that would bring me to remembering the ways of deep, deep loving that I may find my way back to you. my mother's womb. You may hear me say that often. Actually, <laughs> anyone who knows me, knows me by the metaphors, the stories, the narratives of womb, of sperm and egg, common denominators. Denominators that we almost never talk about, and yet a part of our origin narrative. My mother's womb was where I learned the pathways to loving you. Entering into liquid regression. See, you have to remember, we are actually about 85 to 90% water. We are water. We are liquid. And yet we live in our bodies as if we are cement. And yet cement starts off as 90% water. Regression. Regression. Homeland of the ancient wisdom tenders. Healers. The resource of life remembered. Literally 
remembered as we bring the members back together again in a world that is committed to us staying fragmented, isolated, and alone, desperate. for love. So now I will bring you to breathing again. Let us breathe. Let us lean into our breathing. So liquid, we are 80, 85, 90, 95% liquid. But let's go even further, electrons, protons, neutrons, photons, quarks and strings, an orchestra of music hovering, <laughs> playing, dreaming, dancing, colliding, bumping into each other with abandoned liberation. And yet we walk around like cement. I invite you to I bring you into a dream state, a dream I had, oh my God, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 billion years ago, a dream had regression. I will invite you into a dream a dream I had over a billion years ago, a dream, and you were there. Yesterday, yesterday as I was walking, literally on some level, <laughs> some plane, who knows, I was walking, at least that's what it's called. I was walking yesterday, and as I was walking, I heard I heard someone say, who is she? Who is she? I heard them whisper as I walked by. And then I heard the echo reverberate in my own mind say, who am I? Who am I? I breathed. I breathed and I breathed and I breathed, asking the ancestor, ancestors to guide and direct me. Who am I on bended knee? On my knees, I bend and pray. Who? Who? Who am I? I will bring you deeper into this dream, this lucid yet true, confusing, sweat pouring dream. <laughs> they say, when I spread my legs, I bring forth death. That somehow I am armed <laughs> it's really, and extremely dangerous. That's what they say. That's what they say. I am armed. And extremely dangerous. Though it is not I they need to fear, but that of the minds gone mad. 
minds gone mad into distortions, minds projected out, minds that have been imprisoned and poisoned by fear, fear, you know, fear, fear, the potions and elixirs of death, minds gone mad into distortions. It is not I they need to fear because <laughs> I don't do the dance of death, but the dance of life. Life that literally pulsates and tintillates through my very veins. Regression. BC. There is a call, women. A, a call to heal all wounds with every move we make. Movements that are so filled with our passion for love and truth that even the dead stand up and shake and go, mm, 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 mm. who is she? Who is she? I remind us to breathe. I remind us to breathe regression in the beginning. In the beginning, I find myself at the beginning, whatever that means, wherever that is, in the warm, moist embrace. Erotic healing, power transformed by divine grace reformed, moving at soul's radiant pace. Regression. Before the birth of the universe. Before the birth of the universe. Regression. Now, at the entrance gate of my mother's womb, portal dark, lit by a love-filled room, I am tranced in fertile, sacred ground, the holy of holies, my heart has found regression. Sensually, I awake. I awake in dream. I awake. rising from the earthen tomb, pushing beyond destruction's doom. Heart sings, musing me into the trance with the ancestors' sultry rhythms reborn. <laughs> I dance, finding self one regained, relinquishing the archives of trauma's rich, repetitive pain. Synthesizing living reflections, awaken, awaken, awaken hearts somatic protections, portal room, transfigured integrations, moving toward all, all of life's liberations, regression, regression in time, before 
the universe's birth. Where am I now? Where am I now? Regression. Sensually birthed, sensually birthed, sense us all, sensual, sense us all, sensual, sensually birthed, no longer bound, still, love, be found, breathe. I invite you to breathe. <laughs> I invite you to breathe as if your every single cell, your every cell, every single cell depends on you breathing. I invite you to breathe. It cannot be a demand because once it becomes a demand, it is no longer love. Once it becomes a demand, it is no longer love. I invite you to breathe. Love be found. Breathe. What keys? What keys house in spirit's memory sound? Feel, soul's heart call out to breathe deep, deep from the living blood of mother's fertile ground. Breathe. Too many of our brothers and sisters cry out, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Lynched from trees, silenced by knees. I invite you to breathe in their memory, breathe. Unlike, unlock life's treasures. Finally brought true, divine breath moves intimately in me and you. Regression. Regression, unity remembered. Vibratory degradation attempts to destroy unity in every nation. Let me say that again. Vibratory degradation attempts to destroy unity in every nation. <laughs> Yet vibrantly, sensually, and prayerfully, Inseparable oneness continues to perpetuate itself in your sinews. Community is the sacred breath, the holy breath of life. I invite us to breathe. It cannot be a demand because once it becomes a demand, it is no longer love. I invite you to breathe. Life is what we have been taught to fear drop down to the earth, to the root, and let your heart hear. You called, 
breath responded. It's in the design. A living heart bound, breath will not resign. Like the phoenix, life will rise. It belongs to you. You are the prize. I invite you to breathe near and far. For you have come. I end this piece with a song to mother. My earthly mother and the womb. Oh, mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy healing come, thy healing come, thy healing come, thy healing come, thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. I invite us to breathe. For so many of our brothers and sisters, I invite us to breathe. Thank you for allowing me to share this dream with you, this prayer with you, this performance with you. As I was looking at the word to preform, to perform, I realized it's preform. What is the form that you bring? that has called you home. Thank you, family. Ah, I see if, if possible, I see that I have a little bit more time. I think I scared myself. I have to stop doing that. Um, yes, oh, you were booked until um, 3.45. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I scared me. Boo. <laughs> but you know what though? Can we, um, I didn't put in time for, for my introduction to, to bad girls. Yeah. So I'm so willing to go to 3.40. I can do that. Wonderful. Everybody's right. happy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So as you see um, behind me, I have this scenery. I keep this with me so that I can remember that I, that I, we, us, have already done the impossible, <laughs> literally. Oh my God, literally. We have already done the impossible. Please, let me support you in remembering that once upon a time, long, long ago, but not so very long ago, you were smaller than the dot at the end of a sentence. That dot at the end of a sentence is approximately the size of what you looked like when you were the egg of your mother. What's amazing is that that dot 
is approximately the size of a mustard seed. Many of you have heard that story, that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can actually say to this mountain, move. But the teacher during that period of time said, you don't even have faith the size of a mustard seed. But let me remind you, please let me remind you, if you don't receive anything from what I shared today, at one point in time, you literally was the size of a mustard seed. And that's the size of the egg. The sperm is even smaller than a mustard seed. Think about that. Ponder that. That at one point in time, you were that small and you literally, both sperm and egg, were on the verge of death and destruction. And it was their capacity to be able to figure out how to communicate across lines, how to communicate and work together to cooperate to collaborate, to build together. And on the verge of death, they figured out how to communicate with each other. And in the process of reaching for each other, they interrupted the illusion of separation. That's amazing. In my world anyway, we call that amazing. And so, in that we bring with us from the invisible realms, we bring with, the optimal word is with, W-I-T-H, with. It's a very powerful word that we've lost and misplaced, with, because we're so used to working against the systems and the powers that be have us constantly working against this and against that and against this. And yet you were created out of these powerful, ancient, proverbial wisdoms called with. With. And so together they learned to work with each other in deep listening, deep regard, deep respect for the ancient internal wisdom. And so we have all, each of us, we have all done the impossible. We have already done the impossible. Please hear that. We have already done the impossible. We've done it already. And so on this side, at the visible level, it's an opportunity to enter into the deeper resources that our sister, and I won't pronounce it fully properly, and I apologize, Glenists that our sister Glennis Reed invited us into those dark, rich, fertile ground of remembering and imagery and visualization and dropping down to the fertile ground. Be not afraid of the dark. Don't ever be afraid of the dark. I apologize. I am saddened and heartbroken by my brothers and my sisters who have been so violently abused in the dark. But it wasn't the dark that did it to you. You come from holy darkness. And that darkness has been misused and abused. And I apologize. I am so sad that that has happened. All of life, all of the sacredness and the holiness and the preciousness and the beauty and the multiplicity of everything was born out of the fertile ground of your darkness that is beautiful and precious. So 
May we go out into the world excited about breathing, experiencing breath as the gift that it truly is, that has been given to us by our ancestors who breathed for us and breathed us home to grow in love with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you. Thank you for letting me play on the playground with you. Thank you. My pleasure, Elle. Thank you so much for being here again this year. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, my platonic nesting partner wants to know if we're out of mail, so it's very crucial that I reply immediately. Shouldn't be. Try the top shelf. Sorry. I'm over the age of 21, so that means I text really slowly. I don't know how you young people today, with your abilities, try the top shelf. So, all right, so here we are. Um, thank you everybody for allowing me to handle my domestics. Let's do that. All right. So here we go. So, so the bio is not going to take me a whole five minutes to read. So to check in with, uh, with the bad girls who are in the house, I see. Um, are you ready to go on? Could you be ready to go on before 345? Um, yes, we could. Okay, great. Look at your hair. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. Oh, she found the mail. Praise the Lord. Okay, I'm Classy and I'm Nita. We are Bad Girls Inc. Co. We're a sister duo from Philadelphia. We sing, write, and produce our own music. Like Tina Marie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we currently have an album out on all platforms called Bittersweet Cycle of Love. Our single Falling in Love is number four on the album and we have our first video out on YouTube. And whoever's watching on YouTube, We'll see in the chat, they will see all the, all of your links are, sh are gonna show up there. So um, please welcome Bad Girls Inc. Hello. But that's when I kind of 
first realized that, oh, maybe I do have a little voice. And then, you know, like six years ago, my sis was like, oh, we should, you know, start a group. Yeah, yeah. She, she's she a beautiful thing. voice. Like, it, I had to connect with her. And it like, you know, we make beautiful music together, and we're here to show you what we have in store. Um, so today we're going to run through our album, the album that we have on YouTube, on all platforms. So yes. YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, y'all can search our album and, you know, we believe in all feedback. So good. all type of criticism, okay. good, bad, all of that. So um, we want to, to hear what y'all got to say about our album. So our, our album is called The Good Sweet Cycles of Love. And in this album, we go through, you know, the different stages of love. So we got the beginning stage when you first meet somebody, yes, and, and you feel a little sweet. Uh, sweet. You feel a little unsure too. Yeah, like, a little unsure. Sure. Like I don't know. Well for you. And you know us as women, like we be thinking, like you know, you be teasing them a little bit, like you know, what you, yeah. you ain't gonna want to leave, you know, okay. those type of stages. No. So you go down to the point where you yeah. actually get intimate with the person. You know, you start falling into this person a little bit in deep, and sometimes it work out. Sometimes. You know, and so you get intimate with the person, then you fall in love with them, and then after that, you know, what yeah, men, my this is, stage too. and this is, you know what men, since this is a woman's festival, we know what men, like, once we start telling men, you know, we in love with them, or yes. you really feeling them, that's when they start getting them cuckoo, yeah. and they start thinking, like, oh, we got her, and they start acting crazy, mm -hmm. so that's the ending of our album, and kind of trickle down to that point. And it didn't be to the point where, like, should I stay or should I go? So that's how our album is lined up. And that's why we came up with the name, The Bittersweet Cycles of Love. Because yeah. they go through all the different cycles. And so it's really an amazing album. I mean, we had some really good reviews on it as well. I mean, I would believe it if I heard it, but we are like to be around the world, which is amazing. Um, so we look forward to you guys' feedback. We hope that you like it. And our song that y'all keep hearing in the day, this is actually an unreleased song, so we didn't release it yet. This is going to be on our second album, so y'all can kind of hear it, get into the groove of it, you know, before it actually released. So y'all kind of got, y'all got the pre-release preview yes. of our new song that we're going to be dropping soon. Yes. And it's called what? Oh, it's called Jimmy. <laughs> I didn't even say that. Oh yeah, the song is called Genie, and yeah, we're gonna let y'all know when they uh, actually when it actually drops. Um, yeah, y'all can follow us on Instagram uh, at Bad I am uh, official Bad Girl Inc. So it's B A Two D Girl G U R L Z Inc. I N Q. Okay, so there's Bad Girls Inc. So I guess we can get into our first song on on our album on our album Bittersweet Cycle of Love. So our first song can explain it to y'all. It's called Let's Go. Let's Go. It's produced by Shoni Bob. Yes, Shoni Bob. This song was produced by Shoni Bob. Well, and, um, recorded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's recorded by Shoni Bob, which is my nephew. He's also featured on this album. So y'all get to hear him, his versatility uh, on the album. So yeah, we're gonna get into our first song. How it's called, Let's Go. So let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I on the
Yeah, so next, falling in love. I love you. Yeah, I'm gonna get this song y'all gonna like to. Falling in love. 
get over it. So it's just like a lot of things. Like, you know how text messaging and stuff like that? Oh, that's bad. That can ruin the whole oh, stuff. Yes, yes. We kind of, we feel like we the R&B salt pepper. Her. And at the end of the day, I think that's what it is. But, right, I got the mic. I want to let y'all know. This girl right here got some vocals and she second guessed herself back when she was, you know, not even into it. I want you to hit a little, little, you know, one, two, three. I can't let go, cause being confused just takes control. How we can start brand new, cause I don't wanna lose you. Oh no. Uh, so y'all heard that now. Right. 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 So let's get to the you know to the next song here. Um next song is yeah, so y'all be doing a little bit of talking because you know we got we book for an hour. <laughs> <We're Yeah>. <laughs> but we want we want y'all to understand you know this Maybe. hour. And, Right, and of where we're going with it, and the the intricates of this album is amazing. The song is so beautiful, it's well thought out, and we have people that helped us, and they are a great time, a great time to life. So here you go. So this is no one else. Yes. Yes. So we have a feature on no one else. The one, the only. Shawnee Vibes. Um, yeah. So Shawnee Vibes also was the engineer. Yes. No, no, this is Virgin. This is Virgin. We want to give props. Props to Virgin. 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 Anybody need, like, you know, a hot studio? Just hit us up. Hit us up. We got y'all, you know, the folks. Mm -hmm. Also, we want to let y'all know we have to book it anywhere, anytime, any place. Let's stop. Let's go. So, this is our first live recording. Mm -hmm. So, we, we, do, we do perform a lot. A lot. A lot. But um, this is our first live uh, recording, so we didn't know really what to expect. Like we was a little, you know. But well, we are great feeding off of each other, and that's the energy that we bring when we do anything. Our music is feeding off each other. So, what did you what did you expect? I told you, no worries, we got this. Like, we got All right, so this is no one else featuring Shawnee Bob's. Get this. My favorite Stand song, you guys. Got me out of my head, baby. Ain't no one hit this body so good. You say that with all your words. You're just worried about what I need and want. And you hold me so tight, making love. To the morning light, baby, tonight, I'm gonna get sexy, baby, tonight, you gonna be my plaything, I'm gonna make you feel so good, so tonight, I'm gonna just taste it, eat it up, and everything's on my plate, you I 
don't wanna do this with no one else. You got what I need. I don't wanna do this with no one else but you tonight. I'm the sexy baby tonight. I'ma kiss you where you like. Make you feel so good so tonight. I'ma just taste it. Eat it up there and everything's on my plate. Da 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 Hey, y'all. Uh, that's good. no one else. That is someone else. That's one of my favorite songs. I swear. This is something about me. This is does something to me. It's like when you want that, you know, this is that song to me means everything. It's like, you know, when you want this man that's nobody else but this one person. Yeah, that's oh my song. god. I hate the effect. Sorry. I love, love, love that song with everything in me. I, I it's just something. It's a it's a creation for sure. And I, y'all gotta figure out. We said we just gonna say this. Which one of these songs are your favorite song at the end of this? Because I'm telling you, we have one. And you're about to come upset. Yeah, so yeah, that song, no one else. That's our favorite. <laughs> I think that's that song kind of stressed us out. We recorded that song over like three or four times. Yeah, it was a little stressful. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so now we at that cycle. It's like, what part we at when no one else? Like, you feel like it's the person that you yeah. married. You knew he was the one. You knew he was the one. Yeah. You, know, was the one. Yeah. Then, you know what I'm saying? Things change. Like, where You know, you yeah, stay but, up forever. Uh, so, right now, in this, in this cycle of love, so we still in a happy stages. We still in a honeymoon phase. Yes. You know, everything is all sweet. The honeymoon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's, 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 that's the honeymoon phase, and this is another one of her favorites. And you know how they say it's a thin line between love and me. So mm-hmm. after the honeymoon phase, that's when everything kind of like you know, mm-hmm. the real, mm-hmm. the real issues come to the table. But I ain't gonna say that now. Just the real issues that's going to kick in. But do y'all hear this this song? It's like this. This is a this a TikTok noise. Right. It's in my ear. Yeah, but why that part? Is? Uh, it's just stuff. It's like, it's easy. It's stuff. Like, you feel me? It's stuff. Before we go into our next song, this is the song that we, uh, I'm gonna lose. Oh, we not gonna give it up right now. So yeah, we love features. Yeah, yeah like yeah, but it's, listen, I'm telling you right now, if y'all can like this next song, I don't know what to say, but this song is really a hit. It's a hit. And it's this one of my I know it's sweet, it's pretty, you know, it touch you in the right places. And it's not sexual, believe it or not. We tried to keep it PG 13. But, you know, we had to do a lot of that. We're learning. So, our two when it drop is really going to be a PG 13 one on. And just to give you a little snippet of that, we're trying to bring back that love energy that we're missing. You know, the 90s, we want to bring back that love 90s era. Like, we got a lot of the shake you or, you know, I'm single and I'm not. We got a lot of that now. So, we just want to we just want to bring love back. Like, right. There's a lot going on. We got a lot of violence, especially in our community. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of you know trauma. Like, we just, yeah. Where's the love? Like, even you know, though we have bad bad girls, you know we still everybody need love. Everybody want love. We want to bring that energy to my people. So this album by people happens. Number two, two. So we still coming up with everything, the concept, the names, and all that. And we're like I said, we like criticism, we like you know advice of y'all. You know, got any ideas? Oh, we, so we, we, come, we come through smudging people. We got this 
how about what you not but y'all hear this one it's good we think great job the second album is not gonna be no joke it's gonna be sick y'all want to spend the city yeah. it's, it's gonna be amazing but get back to her okay so <laughs> the next song we got we got a lot of songs Okay, so I don't know if you want y'all to take a, a little short intermission. Like yeah, you can take a little time. Because I know our first set started with pulls me over at 410. So we can take a little quick little little file. Yeah, but bed. to stay here and keep focusing the vibe of what it's gonna be spot is be crazy. From this point, we call this the turning point. This is a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. This is a Wednesday song. Yeah. <laughs> we had to give a point right right there. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I will
get back into the album, Bittersweet So right now we're still in a love cycle. Like we were explaining to y'all. We're still in the honeymoon stage. <laughs> Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. The, the natural hair. Yeah. Long hair, I don't care. <laughs> okay, so now we're still in the honeymoon stage. You know? Yeah, and it's feeling good. It's real good right now. You know, you might be seeing a little bit of signs, stuff like that, but you know, you're not too sure. So you still, you know, we do love right here. Yeah, we do good. Have you had a I don't know, y'all gonna like this song. The next song is called Honey. I think we should we I think we should do a video of honey too. That might be nice. That's an idea. Y'all can let us know what y'all think. Oh yeah, maybe y'all can you know people watching or whatever, y'all can go and tell us the song y'all would like to see the video for that too. Hello. So, anybody over here? Let me just pick from a guest list. I would like to check her out or whatever. Um, so, let me go. Honey, 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 baby. Ooh, it's so sweet. Learn from me, baby. Ooh, baby. Hey. That's 
honey. You know, that's one of my favorite songs. Like, I, yeah. I think that was one of the, I can say. <laughs> yeah, like, recording it, it was just like so. Yeah, we the pop out of the house and the house the 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 so we will be little yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a beautiful mistake. But we hope this part of the month, we ain't want to finish my stop talking around this period. Like, this part of the album is going to be getting to the problems. Like, it's like when. You start noticing stuff. Like, you know, yeah. you start, you know, that's when, when you when, when you let a man know that you're falling in love with him, that his love like honey, and you. You know, that's when he started to get Yeah, that's when he started. That blindfold come finally come on. He'd be like, Peek a move. Right, okay? So, this next song is called Issues, and this song is a reggae film. This is another song y'all probably gonna be like, oh my god, why wasn't it longer? Yeah. So, this is another snippet of the song that we might do over. No, my god. Yeah, we can just do the, the last song for them because we still got time. We still got a lot of time. We can't play. 
And so we're gonna go into our last song. So this song on the cycle of love is like when it's the end, like you just ready to be like, oh, we're time to go. You start to stay in the cycle. You start to, you about to pick your bed and go. But like this is, I respect but, this album. The, if this album was the first person, I respect it because she saw it early and she was like, I got to see this out. She stepped the ladder to me. Respect. Like, yeah, so it's still like she ain't all the way leave yet, though, because she's yeah, still she's thinking about it. She she's still thinking about it. it. She's, not, <laughs> she's still thinking about it. Like, it's like it. she's starting to see them two colors and that oh, beginning love. Ooh. So, um, yeah, this is the last song and it's called Too Late. It's, it's never too late, though. So, yeah. <laughs> Lesson, lesson learned, and you move on. 
But she might. And it, 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 it's a super finished thing because it's time for really want things to work out. She has to work out for your you know, she has to be crazy. I personally feel like some people they hold on to things a little longer than they should. You know what you the seasonal person, yeah, let them go, go early. Hey, you know, I, I, I believe in the season. I'll be like, oh, can you do this? Yes. Sorry. Yes. But the signs are true. If you see them signs, baby, don't play with them. This is the out the message for you, honey. Let them go. He ain't no good for you. But in the good times, enjoy the good times. Enjoy the good times. So we are um, coming to the end of our set. How long we got now? Um, until okay, so yeah, until the end of our set. I think our set is Hi. Hi, yeah, until 35 minutes after the hour. Yes. Okay, so no, 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, so we probably don't have time for your other It's okay, but it's okay, yes. So we just, we want to uh, thank, you know, the Black um, Festival. Thank you, know, Ms. Cassandra. We want to thank y'all for giving us the opportunity to perform for y'all today, and we hope y'all check out our album. Bitter yes. Sweet Cycle of Love. Love is on all platforms. Yes, yeah, so y'all can check us out. Check out our Instagram. It's Deb, B-A-W-B, girl, G-U-R-L-Z, Inc, I-N-Q, dot C-O. Perfect. So, Bad Girls Inc. Co. on Instagram and everywhere else. Twitter. Everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Spotify. I'm Classy. I'm Nita. We are Bad Girls Inc. And we are out of here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> trying to see oh I'm talking so well that was mighty refreshing <laughs> um that was really delightful I really enjoyed them they were just what we needed something to just dance to that was great so I'm going to introduce um our next featured artist, who is uh, Stephanie Duran. Stephanie, you're, I think your bio, let me see if, if it'll take me five whole minutes. It's not gonna take me five whole minutes to read it. Are you uh, ready to go slightly early? Stephanie? I'm waiting for Stephanie because I don't want to introduce her if she's off somewhere getting some tea. Let me make sure that I'm my mic is on. It is. Stephanie. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Tina. Technology today. Hey, Stephanie, are you out there? Can you hear me? I guess I'll, I can talk until um, she returns, until she's back. Um, uh, what to say? <laughs> um, I just have so many thoughts, I can't pin one down. Fond memories of the festival, since we, you know, this is our 16th one. I remember one of my fondest memories is our first year, and I saw uh, Io Nash walk in with a couple of women. And Io Nash is a dance legend in Philadelphia. And and I had taken a class from her, a Haitian dance class. And um, I remember I remember she kind of laughed at me a little bit because there's this one exercise where you sit on the floor and you have your legs in front of you, left to the right, you know? And you're supposed to like pretty fast, lift your legs off the floor pretty fast. And I was not good at it. And she kind of laughed at me. 
but you know, it was kind of a loving way. Hey, Stephanie, welcome, welcome back. So um, that's a memory that I have that I own Nash was here. And that was just one of the delights of the festival that my memories of the festival. So, um, so Stephanie, I'm fitting to introduce you. It seems like now is a good time, it's, but I'm gonna wait until you can confirm that for me. Pretty dress. Can you hear me? Uh, can, can you hear me? You can hear me? Okay. You're muted, I think, still. Are you muted or is this your voice because of the thing? Um, this is my voice because as a But I can, I can totally hear you now. I kind of didn't hear you before, but you sound- Okay. Good. I could totally hear you. <clears throat> Yeah, Welcome. I can turn the volume up. Awesome. It's awesome. Well, it's almost time for Stephanie Duran. Stephanie Duran is a writer from Philadelphia, PA, who has performed under various reading series, festivals, and cabarets in the city, including Moonstone Arts Center, Poets and Prophets, Lady Fest Philly, and Black Women's Arts Festival. She was also a participant in the National Book Foundation Summer Writing Camp in 2004. Stephanie has also worked as a freelance journalist covering arts events in the city. Because of her love of music and sound, Stephanie also works as, as a part-time live sound engineer and audio visual technician. Her goal is to one day work full-time as a podcast producer. Very exciting. Please welcome Stephanie Duran. Hi everyone. Um, hope you with me today because I, I'm just getting over a cold and I'm losing my voice. <laughs> um, it kind of recovered a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I will be doing a lot of throat clearing as a result. So again, I hope you can all bear with me in regards to my voice. Um, I'm going to be doing a a few poems today, a lot of them are some older ones. Um, and I have this new kind of piece that one's like a poem and one's kind of a thing. Um, I have my headphones on here, so, cause there's a microphone on it. So hopefully I can better broadcast my voice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the first piece I'm gonna do is called Existing Elsewhere. And I wrote this back in 2019. Um, the University Arts did a event, um, it was like a week-long event, it was called School for Temporary Liveness, and it was different kinds of performances and workshops, and they did this one dance where um, it started out in Rittenhouse Square Park, and it kind of ended up um, in, I forgot the name of the building, it's like one um, ATs and it's in Rittenhouse Square. Um, and it kind of started out as kind of like this little happy dance that everybody's kind of following everyone in the building. And once it turned, once it came in, and it kind of came in this whole different kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, like macabre kind of thing. And it was really interesting. And I saw it twice. And I was inspired to write this poem because of this. <coughs> Where else do they go, these bodies? Just as happy and loving as they can be. Just as afraid, skulking, jumping, fighting for their space. These bodies, dancing to the beat of another world, echoes layered on hymns, <coughs> polyphonics layered on screeches. I don't know if they cry for help or if they declare, I am here, I exist. These bodies twist around sound waves and frequencies outrun by short waves carried by longer ones. These bodies writhing in a building with good bones. Maybe I walk in a room, white walled, ancient, showing a small part of its insides of beams and muscle, brick, muscle red brick walls. These bodies, run, jump, and cut through air, fitful limbs breaking through gazes. We take up space. These, like you, <coughs> as you walk closely, 
turn your necks, cock your heads for a closer look on how to take up space. These bodies, so few of us can move this way, add or subtract colors, genders, creeds, religion. You're only allowed to move so much. Some who make the rules move more than others. These bodies move all over this space. How many of their ancestors could only move in certain spaces? <clears throat> How many were only seen to only serve as they dreamed to move about in peace and freedom? Pirouette in the corner, travel the floor through the distance, distorted voices, answering back with their feet. These bodies, how many of them brought here and free with strength to sit and to sit and be proper as was their station, to dance a waltz or a dainty two-step, how they would gasp at the loose pants and bare feet, making themselves known in every corner. <coughs> <Excuse me. clears throat> These bodies dancing in twisted sounds. I think I don't know what's going on, and that's okay. I think how I can sit still and move at the same time. This body in this small spectating space, dancing, feet moving in time with the dancers, sitting in small spaces, contorting my frame on a different plane. This body, an indentured servant to the mind. Don't take up space, move through the world unnoticed. Instead, I leap, legs riding on the wind, to a perfect landing. My high kick falls with the silk scarf's grace and I travel with other bodies, uniting and taking up space. This body, nobody knows how I dance in circles around them. And each move is choreographed by the way the wind blows. These bodies, our bodies existing. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I also was inspired in a way to write that poem because um, in 2018, I believe, I was in the French festival for a, um, a flash mob uh, dance choreography. It was called the Super Grand Continental and we all danced like right by the steps of um, the art museum. And it was just great to be with about 150 people, I believe, that were just every walk of every different walk of life just to be there and just just to dance i mean i, I love dancing uh, this next piece is called blue leaf and um this is kind of a poem i wrote for my mom um she passed away in 2016 and i um you know and when you lose a parent you know if you have a good relationship with that parent it can be really hard and it can be hills and valleys and when you think you're over it, you're kind of not. And um, <clears throat> there is one part that I sing in there, but I'm not even gonna attempt it because of my voice. And, and unfortunately, um, it's hard for me now just because my voice is not at full power, but I'm, I'm gonna power through it. <laughs> a look, a bad word, or being rabid dog need can turn your patina on your green to blue. Blue leaves can't fly in the sun to shine in and twirl in the wind. They fall down limp, trying to glide through the world as I curl in the grassy blades, trying to get green again. <clears throat> curl yourself up as the invisible rain falls, mourning in the morning that your tree is gone. The reaper showed up in teal that day, swirling in her robes as she chopped your tree down and took her back home. Teal lady reaper dancing in robes, with one mighty swing, she took mama home, swirled in the moonlight as the tree withered on. One mighty swing, she took mama home, holding her hand, flowing in the breeze, sweet baby lease with her mama tree, teal lady reaper dancing in robes. One mighty swing, she took mama home. Every breeze and gusty wind, the blue leaf tries to fly again and be as green as the mother tree made her to be. She knew that sun, she knew that the sun was your spotlight, the earth was your stage, and the roots held you up silently, cheering her on. Yet the brightest sun can feel like invisible rain, and down with those unseen drops you fall. Between the grass, hiding again, 
looking at the blades, turning their noses up at you. The teal lady reaper, <clears throat> mother tree shrinking, the, sun, the sunshine blocked by her robes and the mighty swing that knocked her down to bring her back home. Can't blend with the grassy cousin, the mighty leaf fallen from the tree, drying up in invisible rain, fighting to turn your green from the blue. And just an added note that little rhyme part, the Teal Lady Reaper, that's the part I would have sung and it would have been to the tune of Afro Blue. And also with the color teal, um, that is the color of the ribbon for ovarian cancer, which my mother passed away from. And unfortunately it doesn't get as much attention as breast cancer. It's not marketable. Let's just keep it a hundred. Um, <clears throat> my next piece, um, this is a really old one. It's called Just Another Woman. And I got inspired to write this um, by Lamont Steptoe. He did a piece called Chaos and Redemption, um, which, you know, as, as any of you know him, he was a Vietnam War vet and he's written poetry um, about his time, the Vietnam War. And I'm gonna read the part that, I'm gonna read the stanza that he wrote that I kind of riffed off of. <clears throat> War is a beautiful whore, unblemished by time. Peace is a toothless hag we've diminished from our sight. And that was Lamont Stepto, Chaos and Redemption. She and her six worldly sisters in their house of four corners were told to forget about the names of creators whispered in their souls. Oshun, Ashura, Gaia, Ma'at, <coughs> excuse me. She's shown that no one will love her for her natural beauty. And the only woman with the power of men at her feet is Miss Ajani. She's just another woman with a made up face who's asked who her daddy is by an old man named Sam who wants her to call him uncle and tells her that he should always pray to her intelligently designed father. The boys all love her. They think she's the cutest in girls clothes and wave tricolored patches torn from her dress. They'll gladly take her first name and adopt their skies, mountains, and plains, but will call themselves matriots. She lets loose those hormones as the horror moans through the sound of explosions. She's penetrated by guns coming smoke and bullets. Toy soldiers whistle and catcall when they see their scarred flesh, ignoring the sickly green complexion of the set, set on the statuesque liberty. She's just another bitch choked on a gem studded short leash, looking good while she spreads in between shining seas, but her geographic skin dies slowly to ashes, to dust, to earth. In 12 hours, she takes her clothes off, the star studded veil she was born with. And 12 hours later, she'll dim the lights <clears throat> to hide the face she will die with. She looks away from all the suns she carries, but still cradles them as they tell her how to live. Her sons and founding fathers present her as Yahweh's corn-fed, blood-quenched trophy girl with red cheeks, white skin, and blue eyes, tossing her amber waves of flame with youth, youth and ignorance on her side. She shows the world she's the new it girl, but she's just another woman. Thank you. Um, this new piece, um, it's called Sound Bites. And I, um, I'm sure a lot of you um, listen, listen to KYW. I usually listen to it uh, when I get up to go to work or whatever, or go out in the street. And um, they, you know, they have all these sound, but you know, the big thing, not, not that it's a big thing now, but um, the issue with the increased gun violence in the city. And they have all the sound bites of all the people discussing it and saying like, oh, it's so dangerous now, blah, 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 blah. And, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing I noticed that all the voices were pretty much white voices. And so I'm just sitting here like, well, we're a, 
you know, voices of color, like where are those who are most affected by this gun violence? And I kind of remember um, how they ended this one group of sound bites. This one woman said, oh, my friend's moving to Allentown because she's so sick of it. And I'm sitting there thinking like, Allentown isn't that much less violent. So good luck with that. But um, anyway, this is still kind of a work in progress. And it's just sound bites. <clears throat> Where are the sound bites of the ones who swell in the thickness? Where are the sound bites from neighborhoods who see bullet sparks, who see bullets spark up like light bugs and shells on the ground like dead lanternflies? Where are the silencers who muzzle the voices of the vulnerable with any version of they kill each other and what about the crimes among the colors? Where are the muzzling hands that grow eyes ears and mouths, when men, the color of fish bellies and the blush of flesh wounds, hold their rifles and tactical gear, selling themselves as the next American hero, holding his big gun as their mouth tails hide under themselves. No matter how loud we shout or move in silence, the world makes the effort not to hear us. Our voices for them fade in and out, like tuning through the channels on the radio. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are sound bites everywhere from outside of cities as images and sounds in digital form reassure the homogenous small town fears. Our sound bites are rooted or routed to a void where they queue up the designated standard to fill the airwaves. <clears throat> Thank you. I I do kind of put in some kind of audio engineering type speak. I'm talking about like queuing things up and routing things. And um, and as um, I, Cassandra had mentioned in my bio, um, I do work live sound. Um, I work at also as an AV technician. Um, I used to work at um, what used to be the University of Sciences, um, which is now St. Joseph's University. And unfortunately I got laid off because of that merger. So, you know, I'm still, so I'm back on the interview trail again. And I had one actually this week and I think that's where I caught my cold. So I'm just thankful it's not COVID. <laughs> and so I've been kind of freelancing and doing sound gigs. And um, I probably will uh, start in the later in the fall again, um, working for Rotunda. So they kind of need a fill in. So it's kind of great because I like working at venue. Um, this piece, um, this is kind of part of a series I'm kind of putting together. Um, if you were here last year and heard me last year, um, I was living uh, with a friend in Nazareth, Pennsylvania because of my financial problems and kind of had um, really no place to live because I was living in Northeast Philly and my sister was selling um, the house that my mom lived in. So my friend was very generous enough to say, you know, hey, come with me. And um, it's been interesting. That's kind of the nicest thing I can say about it. And um, I um, was kind of in the process of kind of writing my experiences there, but kind of making it sort of a, a retro futurism kind of sci-fi kind of thing. Because actually, the family she lived next to, um, it. it you know, every every kind of trailer trash stereotype that's out there, they kind of fit it. And um, I guess it's kind of a short story, I guess. And this was actually around the time <clears throat> that I wrote this. Um, I was interviewing for my job via Zoom at University of Sciences. And a lot of times when you feel like you're searching, um, it can be very, those interviews can be very draining. And um and plus, you know, I do deal with depression and, you know, given my current state at the time, you know, it was hard to kind of be like, hey, I'm bright and shiny and, you know, please hire me. And, um, sorry, excuse me for one second. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, hope you didn't hear that, but it might have. Um, <clears throat> and so I was kind of, I kind of wrote this little, I guess, short story, I guess, as a result. And this is called Dispatch, This Place Weighs Heavy. 
my ancestor host and I are merging again, emerging again in another memory. Feeling of trauma, feeling or trauma melds us together. I don't know where I begin or end again. The tissues attached to my temples and under my eyes melt as if, as if it were oil seeping into my skin. Another experience that ties us together, another chance at victory or defeat. The pandemic of this time still has its barriers. Being away from home in a small white town is a bigger one. Here we go again, we both thought, the song and dance. She wonders if, if this is the time she'll be caught or if she'll fall. She's fallen more often in these situations. For the past month, she's heard, thank you, next, before she hits the stage. And be it flowery, unfortunately, we've decided to move forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was hard enough to get this far to prepare herself under the heaviness the schedule early in the morning so the kind hostess's neighbors aren't making any noise. The two-legged wolves always howling and leaving their cigarette-filled scent on the porches nearby. Letting the whole world in that small house that their presence is known. Then there was one of the wolves who was out making the same hoops, hollers, and brays. It was a roller coaster of sound a slide whistle going soft to loud with all those notes out of order and off key. In the oddest times, there would be an outburst of laughter that felt like a bird flying away. My host started to reminisce about a time she couldn't touch the ceiling in a home. In a small room, she can touch the ceiling with her hand and stop just where the palm connects to her wrist. Hers was a tall, stern body that carried generations of scars and ancestors in small surroundings. She survived, but it doesn't make her yearn for a space that even she would need assistance to touch. But it does make her yearn for a space that even she would need assistance to touch the upper wall. As of now, it is time to put on her shoes and dance for these men, looking back at her in their ancient flat screens. Time to get her pen ready and resound and recite how she is the best for the job. Yes, sir, I work real good. I do this before, so. She wonders if that's what they see on the screen if she's there. She guess she'll be the only one, whether it's race or sex, that makes the token. It can be lonely at times. This place weighs heavy. <clears throat> Every step and arm swing is a fight in murky water. We both missed our minds when we can move freely, dance, frolic in concrete jungles and our make, and our, of our making, including high buildings, dirty air and streets. We both knew that long times mean nothing. They smile, chat, and tell you're adored and they pretend to be your dance partner, lift you up and we say, in that case, catch me as a smile covered our entire faces. I was luckier than her, being caught more often, but we both been bruised from falling. Yes, sir, I work real good, sir. Big smile, made up face, hoping they don't see her sweat, not from nerves, but from the thick heat in the room, or hear the chaos down the street, or the quick bark of the dog downstairs or the kind hostess sounding even louder, ironically to quiet her down. Just smile, sell your song and dance. All the sweat in Pennsylvania won't loosen that Dubarian mask right now, Dunbarian mask right now. Yes, sir, no, sir, I work real good, sir. Those walls pushed by the whitest hands won't close in on her so easy like. That time bomb full of acid and nerves that went off in her chest and that left side, or was it the right side of the brain, won't bring her down. We both float upwards. Even in this heavy place, we still keep moving. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, thanks again for your patience and all this. I, I hate the fact that I lost my voice, but luckily it, kind of cleared up mostly today because if it was on a Tuesday I wouldn't even be here I had absolutely no voice 
And um, also, I, I guess in case you haven't missed it, I am back in Philadelphia now. And ironically, in that one part, because my friend lived in a carriage house and there were low ceilings. And yes, when the bedroom I was in, when I lifted up my hand, like I could basically touch the wall. And now I'm in this apartment with high ceilings and <laughs> there, I could nowhere near touch him. Um, <clears throat> this um, piece I did, I actually did this as a workshop piece. And I, I'm so glad I found it because this is one of my favorite things I could have wrote. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the rock group Thin Lizzy, um, and it was led by a biracial singer, uh, Phil Lynott. He was um, half Irish, uh, half uh, Afro-Latino. And so we kind of had to write a pan about his, we read the write a poem about a historical figure, so to speak. And but this was the kind of the one I chose because I, I saw a documentary on him a long, long time ago, back in 04 or 03. And, just the interesting life that he dealt with and how he kind of had how he had to deal with racism um in the UK <clears throat> and just finding his place in rock and roll because he was like a black lead singer in which we really didn't see that much when back in the 70s. And I'm kind of upset too because my voice can't do it justice right now. So this is the pan of Phil and, and this is a side note, what a pan is, it's basically, um, it's a style of poetry that basically you're kind of, it's like self-praise. It's basically like, you know, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. So think about it like kind of as a rap, you know, like so especially like back when, yes. Could, you, could, could this be the last one? Cause your set was at five o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, you, yeah. You could the last one. Okay. okay. And this one isn't long, so I apologize. No problem. <clears throat> so yeah, this is my last one. Uh, the pan was the pan of film. I stand with the soul of rock and roll in my bones, caught in the lunar spotlight of the stages on the stages of Mima. I am the native son of the Paris Duke and the Gaelic goddess Philomena. Never saw Brazil in Paris. So I became a little, the little black boy, not knowing his place, just playing his bass. It was no disgrace. I am the dark half brother could call him the voodoo shadow of James Joyce. The Dublin streets and schoolyards where my battlefield was a color line drawn in the sand. I am the Celtic legend of modern times, the ax men, flashing skin, baseline deep with a bad reputation for dozen whiskey in the jar. I vibrated the world with my guitar, but I took the wrong turn to the opium trails walking for the last time in 96 with smack lucky 86. I felt like the mystical brother and the tears of the goddess shed for me. I took my life in my own hands and I abused it. Now I sing the freedom song and vibrate the sky with bass quakes and my bad reptant tat and echo my battle cry. I'm a, rockin', I'm a rocker and I'm a roller too, honey. Thank you. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over. <laughs> That's okay. It's my job to keep an eye on that. Um, you're, you're part, partly your job, but not, but mostly my mm -hmm. job. Um, I don't know if you saw the chats, but um, but people are sending in some nice things about your poetry. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for your poetry um, and and the backstory behind them. I always like to hear that so up next is moi cassandra xavier i have a long bio that i'm going to read and so i'm probably only going to have time for uh one song I, the reason i'm choosing to read this bio because it's a bio i wrote for sister space which is one of my favorite gigs to do and makes me very happy i'm always very very happy in women's space and, um, and this is the bio I created for one of my most recent times featuring there. Sandra Xavier, cis female, pronouns she, her, is a leeway transformation award-winning singer, songwriter, uh, multi-genre author, and community cultural arts organizer and founder of the Black Women's Arts Festival. Her work is to share her journey as an artist with various life challenges, including mental health issues and recovery from childhood abuse. 
Cassandra considers herself a Renaissance Negress, a multimedia healing artist, and a special needs adult. She is a proud bearded woman as well. A Virginia Giordano Memorial Fund honoree and previous Sister Space Weekend performer, performer the openly LGBTQ plus singer has co-billed with Alex Stopkin, Lucy Blue Tremblay, Trep Fuhrer, Toshi Regan, Pat Humphreys of Emma's Revolution, Ubaka Hill, and the late Ann Robeson of Sapphire, Uppity, Blue, Uppity Blues Women, among other folk, pop, rock, blues, and jazz artists. Since 2002, Cassandra has independently released eight original recordings described as a cross between Tracy Chapman, Chardet, and Enya, and her live and her album Live at Tin Angel was honorably mentioned by Philadelphia City Papers MJ Fine as the number nine of top 21 local EPs of 2007. Her seventh album Hope was released at Tin Angel in February 2015 and Philadelphia Weekly's uh, Stephen H. Siegel wrote that it is quote, a gorgeously minimalist showcase for Xavier's throaty Tracy Chapman via Dar Williams sincerity assembling catchy original acoustic ballads alongside a surprisingly eclectic roster of conceived covers. WXPN 88.5 FM's uh, Amazon country host Deborah D'Alessandro has said, quote, her stage presence is one part sex kitten serenading in heels, two parts powerhouse kick-ass feminist troubadour poet. In concert with Cassandra Xavier, there is never a dull moment, end quote. So before I sing, I wanted to talk about the song that I'm gonna sing, it's called Bob Song. I don't know if you can see me, but um, the, the story behind the song, it's a love song for this time that I had going to this blues bars and just blues bar and being just surrounded by love and affection. So at some point years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to play and sing blues. So I thought, go to South Street Blues. I went to South Street Blues and uh, there was this thing called Bob's Monday Night All-Stars. And the person hosting it was this bassist named Bob or B-O-G. And um, his wife was there sometimes and everything. So it wasn't like I was trying to get with him, but I just found him very attractive and I would just enjoy watching him play. But I was surrounded by attractive guys at the time in, in that bar. Maybe it's just being, being uh, seduced by the music that was happening there, this live music that was great, that I just loved. And I ended up meeting somebody there who I lived with for a short time. And uh, this line in the song that goes, who brings, me, who brings to me my muse? That was my muse because while I was with this guy, I, I wrote two songs and three chapbooks, I think. He was a Pisces. <laughs> so um, this, is song, this is called Bob's Song and it's on my album, Beautiful. Actually, it's on two albums. It's on Beautiful and then it's, and then it's like, remixed on my album Live at the Craft Brow, Kalamazoo. The battery is falling out of my, my guitar. So after me, Erica Richards will be here. So after this, I'll introduce Erica. Illustrator. Yes, this is good. So 
holding hands A woman They look like strings But what is playing is Angel They sound like a story But what is singing is History Her story man Understanding So I forgot to mention that was an open mic place. I mean, it was a bar that had live blues all the time, but the box Monday night thing was an open mic. So I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever really learned to play blues. <laughs> but I got a lot of love material. Okay, here we go. How do I do with time? Perfect, 515, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, up next is Erica Richards. So I'm just gonna look up her bio on my trusty mobile cellular unit. There we go. Erica, are you all set? I mean, I see that you're there. Can you communicate with me that you're ready to go? Erica. Erica. Maybe perhaps nature called at the last minute. That's what I was feeling before I was perform gonna perform. I thought, great. Now, now I wanna go to the bathroom. Not for the last six hours, but now. Hey, are you ready to be introduced? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, here we go. Erica Richards says, I received my BFA in illustration from Moore College of Art and Design, Philadelphia, PA. My artistic focus is black women of grandeur and fantasy. My art is a reminder to the world that black people's existence surpasses the American history story. We are deeply woven into human existence. We were there wearing the same fashion, same hairstyles with wealth and influence. The, the viewer will have an epiphany seeing the majesty of black people penetrating the world far beyond class, race and culture. Please welcome Erica Richards. 
Hi. <laughs> well, wow. we definitely got the, the timing where it's like the sun is just, this is the hour where I usually I'm in the back because the sun is just, just coming in. So I hope you guys can see. So uh, thank you so much, Cassandra, for that introduction. Thank you so much and for inviting me back um, each year. So as she said, my name is Erica Richards. I got my, ba my uh, bachelor's degree in illustration from the Moore College of Art. I'm just gonna share my screen because I got a little uh, slideshow. Right. So really this, um, a lot has happened since the last time I was here and the last time that I talked to, uh, you know, was at the Black Women's uh, Festival. So since then, I have opened up an art gallery. Um, I always wanted to open up an art gallery. I knew, you know, even when I was younger, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to be, an, you know, a freelance artist, but I still wanted to open up an art gallery. And I'm located in the um, Chestnut Hill area, so I'm on the hill. And um, what's just so amazing is that, um, as you can see in two, 2018, that this is just so serendipitous and how the Lord really works, is that I started, this is, I think, before I even started my business, I think I was still hustling. I think the only thing I had was my uh, business bank account, where my mom said, at least, please just get a business bank account. And I think we just had um, a vendor's license. And the first fair that I ever did was here in Chestnut Hill. Um, I was going to say right outside where my business is now, but no, it was further up near the bank. And it was, I had a busted tent. <laughs> I had a busted tent. I borrowed it from my aunt and the leg was broken. So it couldn't come down. So we had to prop the leg on the table and just pray that it hit nobody, that it didn't hit nobody. Cause I don't even think we had insurance. I hope we did, but I'm not sure if we did because I was not a legit business at the time. And that day I actually won um, first place for best illustrator. And now come 2022, I'm here in that same neighborhood, opened up my, my gallery. And it's just, that's just wow. So, so, so as you can see, these are just the little timeline. I opened up my business in 2019. And the funny way that I opened it was um, right after I graduated school, I started teaching. And I kid you not, I, I just, if I didn't stop teaching, I wasn't going to have children because that's just how hard it was. And in between the, um, the summer break and the winter break, um, I would just hustle. I would go to shows. I would do whatever I could you know, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an artist. I didn't want to be a substitute teacher. And then one day my mom just came up to me during the summertime when I was just dreading going back this, the next school year. And um, she said, well, why don't you not go back? And I said, OK. <laughs> and that's how it started. <laughs> and thankfully, because I am not financially savvy, she is. She's been in finance for 20 some odd years. The Lord told her to leave her job and come and support me in my business. And that's where we are today. She is the CFO of my company and she deals with all the financial and closing my books and everything. So I can just sit here and create work and deal with the artists in the gallery. So since then, I also had amazing opportunities. I became a um, fellow with the Mural Arts of Philadelphia. So when the pandemic started and, you know, that was the same time with Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd, a lot of these businesses, they already knew, but they were just scrambling like, oh, snap, we need Black artists in here. We don't have no Black artists. So it was just a wave of all kinds of businesses just saying, 
you know, we don't even care if you good, just as you black as you an artist, please come in. <laughs> so um, a gentleman that uh, he owned a tavern, he asked, he, no, he sent me the uh, link to enter to be a fellow for Mural Arts. And I became one. That was the inaugural year. I think it was 2020, maybe 2021 was the inaugural year. And since then, they've just announced their 2022 fellows. So it's still going on where it's a whole fellowship and cohort just for Black artists. And from that, they contacted me. And this is the TD Banks um, that is downtown. If you can see in the background, that is the um, City Hall. And they said I was submitted into a contest or um, some TD Banks wanted Black art on their windows outside and I was chosen. So that's just amazing that right now downtown, if you go through downtown Center City, Philadelphia, my artwork is on a building right there. And then the Philadelphia Inquirer came to me and they asked me to do an illustration for their uh, food, food and drink sections so with this illustration is um, right here. And it was the first time I really did any digital work since college. And I was really nervous, but I was also kind of confident too. And I'm just glad that it came out well. And I remember when it came out and she said, uh, the publisher said it's out. We went to the store and we bought it. Let me, we bought the, uh, the paper and I made this noise. I was just so, it was just so surreal that my artwork was in a newspaper that I made this noise that I cannot repeat it. I just made this squeal <laughs> and I started crying and just thanking the Lord for the blessings that he gave me. So this is into the art gallery. So another blessing, like really this whole thing is just talking about blessings he's given me. So this art gallery initially started out as not even a really a pop-up. Um, it started out as um, the pandemic again. It made, it opened up so many doors and opportunities for, you know, artists of color and female artists um, that, Chestnut Hill was dying. It was really, really dying. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to Chestnut Hill or know about it, but I'm just gonna say it's a very lily white neighborhood. It's very Republican, it's very old, it's very right, right wing kind of thing. And the pandemic just changed all of that. It looked like a literal ghost town um, here. And some artists came up to the, you know, the very large property. Or he most he owns most of the property in Chestnut Hill and said, well, why don't you put some art in those empty storefronts or give a building, a vacant building to an artist for a month to just do a pop up? And that's what they were doing. And they called it um, Second Saturdays. So Second Saturdays was just you get a building for one month, you can put on a show or whatever you want to do. And then the next month it gets given to another artist. So I was, uh, oh, and on top of that, they would have artists outside, just little pockets of vendors and live musicians and stuff. So I was one of the artists out on the street vending and the uh, event manager at the time came to me and said, have you ever thought of putting on a show? And I said, of course. And this is the building that they gave me for second Saturday last year, last September. And I was only supposed to be in here for September. And then they were going to give the building to another artist. But apparently Jesus said, no, you're going to stay in here. So I stayed in here from September all the way until June rent free, rent free. And we just signed the lease in June for this to be the official art gallery. And it is called Queen Louise Art Gallery in case um, anybody wanted to know. And these are the artists that are displayed in Queen Gallery right now. I still have the same ex exhibition up called Different Gifts that I started the gallery with. Um, in the future, I would like to change around the show. Um, but these are the amazing artists that are in here. These are the wonderful customers that I've had over the years. And down here, this is the Queen Louise uh, gallery logo. 
And that's why it ends with God ain't finished with me because he's not. He just keeps surprising me every single time. So these are the uh, social medias for, so this is my personal social media. And then I have a social media for the art gallery. I don't have a website yet, but we will. Oh, stop sharing. So that is the end of the slideshow. And if you have any questions or anything, please send them forward. Oops. Hi, I just wanted to show off your beautiful mugs that I've gotten the last one of the last um, Black Women's Arts Festival that I've gotten from you. And I love this, my favorite mug out of all of them. Wow! Wow! I didn't know I was going to have customers on here. <laughs> my goodness! Oh wow! Yes, I had to come and see your gallery because I, I love Chestnut. I love the used to walk up there a lot in high school. So I think it's amazing that you have a gallery there. So I'm, I proud. am so blessed, and you know the it it really has changed where there is so many. Black businesses and specifically Black female-owned businesses now in Chestnut Hill. There, um, there's a flower shop. There's um, a there's a new gallery that just opened up last Saturday. There's another one that's all African, um, where she gets all her stuff shipped in directly from um, the continent. It's just amazing. There's a there's a haberdashery that's up there, and I know that quite. I, I haven't met too many Black people that know what a haberdashery is, but that's just amazing that it is owned by a Black gentleman. And there's a spice store and there's going there's a hair salon. So it's just amazing because I know Chestnut Hill would never have had this many Black owned businesses back in, I would say, my mother's day. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yes, yeah, so I'm really happy to hear all of your amazing blessings and things. <laughs> Thank you so much. Not a problem. Are there any other questions or anything else I should talk about? I mean, I, you know, I could show since I'm in the art gallery so often. Maybe if I can get out of the sun, I'm just going to, I'm just going to move my laptop to the back of the room. You do have till 610, Erica if that gives you an idea of how to fill the time. I know, I really do. I should just give you guys a whole tour. Well, here's some of the work behind me. And I could at least show you, you know, what I've been working on because the gallery I'm in here so often, it's really my art studio now. So I could bring some work in. So this is what I'm very, very currently working on. I mean, I stopped working on it to get on the Zoom. So this right here, she's called a uh, flower head and she's gonna be a series. So there's two other pieces um, with the whole thing as her hair is flowers. And I, I'm not, I think I always had this idea where it's like, I would see these beautiful women with, you know, the natural hair out to here and just thinking of that as a full bouquet. And so that's where this, this came from. And I will get my other pieces. <laughs> This right here is Black Beauty. And I believe she's the first piece that I did for um, 2022. And I don't do too many dark skin um, figures. So I really, really 
made sure that I was like, I'm going to do a dark skinned woman. And this one is called Warrior Stance. And I still have to finish her. She took me the 70, 78 hours and I'm still not done with her. So she just, she's all just regular graphite pencil and everything, but the background is ink because I just couldn't get it dark enough. I was totally going to ask you what your, because I'm like, that can't be a paintbrush unless you're a robot. <laughs> no. So I was going to ask you what your tools were. Yeah. So this one's graphite, but the background is, uh, but what do you tend to use the most? I use uh, mostly... It depends. So I, I was using watercolor for quite a while, and but I'm still learning on how I want to do my style and watercolor. Um, this piece right here is all watercolor. But I'm still deciding on my style and how I really want to work with it. Maybe I want to get different brands of watercolor. Um, I mostly am more proficient in their graphite pencils and um, colored pencils. And I think because I like the control, you know, there is <laughs> the watercolors, you kind of just got to let it do what it do, but you have lots of control with pencil and colored pencil. Yeah. The one to your immediate right behind you, back right, brown, back your, your right, that, yeah, is that, what is that? Acrylic, watercolor? So this piece is actually, um, so the pieces that you're looking at are the artists that are in the gallery. So this gentleman, his name is David Coleman, and this is all acrylic. And okay. David is actually mostly a digital, digital artist, but um, he made these pieces for the, for the galleries. So it's mostly digital work. And this is his other piece over here. This is Joy, okay. also acrylic. Okay. And the rest of the pieces are from an artist who actually is a, a fellow at the Mural Arts with me. That's how I met her. And her name is Athena. And her stuff is done with charcoal, acrylic, and something called an oil stick. I've Ever seen it, nor have I heard of it, but it looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know. I, I didn't know. I sh well, tomorrow I'll be ready with maybe something a little bit longer since I have this so much time. <laughs> um. I want to ask how your mother is. Oh, she's good. She's good. Um, she is actually a teacher at St. Joe's um, University while also being my CFO. Um, because I'm like, you know, I can tell people for real, this for yourself, it's not easy. It's, it's not easy at all. And sometimes somebody to get a second job while the business is still growing. And that's something that she had to do. So she teaching. You know what, because we've done the festival before and, I, and I've met your mother and I know she's been very supportive of your artistry. It's just, I just realized that I had assumed that she had always been supportive. Was there a time when your mother, when you, did it take her a while to decide, yeah, my, my daughter can make a living as an artist? Or so, um, the answer to that is yes and no. So, um, I was younger, like most art students, like when I said I was substitute teaching, I had a couple of art students. So artists usually, they want to draw instead of doing work. And that's what I wanted to do. So I was drawing instead of getting my work done. So I would get in trouble. And just being a good mom, she would tell me stop, you know, could you stop drawing and get your work done? Could you do that? promise and I would I would start off real good and it did not work out so she was just 
I believe she wasn't trying to hinder me. She was just trying to be a good mother. And also she loves education. So that's very important to her. So she would take my books away. She would take my pencils away, thinking that would get me to focus and, you know, do your work. But I was just too, too determined. I don't know how I got the paper and the pencil again, but I got all that stuff. And after, I don't know how many teacher, parent teacher conferences, she finally realized, you know what? she's not going to stop doing this. She's really not going to stop doing this. And I believe she said she saw herself in me. She saw that she's not going to stop doing this resilient thing that she has. So she knew this is what this is. And she knew from her own experience with herself that either you get on this train or you get out the way. <laughs> so that's when she stopped saying, stop drawing. That's when she started buying me art supplies and sending me to art camps and the Winter Museum Club and, you know, things like that. So she started, um, wasn't that she wasn't not supportive. It's just when she finally realized I'm not going to stop doing this. That's when she got more support. Let me not just let her draw, but let me also buy art supplies and let me also get her into art classes and art clubs. Kind of, if you can't beat them, join them. It really was. Because she knew. Because, you know, she's like that and my dad is like that. That's why she stopped fighting it. She was like, I, it's like, get on this train to get off. Because it's, it's going to run you down. Okay. <laughs> but it ain't stopping. Wow. Feel free to ask if anybody has more questions. Because I am going to dig up a bio I need for two things from now. So I'm gonna silence myself. I guess I'll ask a question. Like, um, what are your favorite subjects to draw or paint or create? Black ladies, black women straight up. I love painting and drawing black women. That's all I really do every now and again. I'll paint um, or draw a woman of a, another race. And that's usually, you know, from popular culture. Like, um, I like the show. It's called, um, oh my goodness. What is it called? Outlander. I like Outlander. And one of the characters, her name is Claire. And I drew Claire because I really liked it. But when I'm just, you know, my, my portfolio is all Black women. And it came from, I love fantasy. And I also love history or basically the romanticism of history because history ain't that fun, ain't that fun of a subject if you know real history. <laughs> but the thing about it was, you know, going into the museums and art museums and things like that and these beautiful paintings with these, you know, women just in these awesome Victorian and Baroque style dresses. And I was like, why can't a black lady be wearing that? I, I want to see. I want to see how a black lady looks in this, you know, gorgeous Victorian dress and this opulent house back here. And the thing about it is, there were black women and black men that were educated and wealthy and had influence that was wearing those things. It's just we don't always know about them. So my thought was, okay, as a black artist, a lot of times I say you can't just create art for the, you know, for art's sake. Like I know a lot of Caucasian people and uh, Asian people, you know, well, mostly Caucasian. You could just paint for paint, but if you're a black artist, it's gotta have some kind of meaning behind it. It's almost like your art also is an extension of the black community. So you gotta say something with your art too. You just can't do something light and fun. But I was like, you know what? Black art has already been political. It's already showed the devastation and the trauma. So I was like, let me show the other side. Let me show the fun. Let me show the opulent. Let me show the, the you know, the just the crazy, you know, um, aristocratic side. Let me show that side because that side is not always talked about. You talk about, you hear about the struggle in the slavery, but you don't exactly hear about there were aristocrats too. Awesome. And you, and you also had that thing about retelling uh, fairy tales. Yes. Yeah, so my senior thesis, 
because, you know, um, as a little girl, all of us, well, not all of us, but, you know, you know, you got the Disney princesses and things like that. And you just recently get a Black princess with Princess Tiana. Or your only um, other education of a Disney princess was Brandy from the Cinderella version, which both of them are amazing. But it's two out of millions that I was going to do book covers of classic fairy tales and uh, of where the characters were African-American and they also had natural hair too. So a really, really common thing that happens when people start going for what they want and you know reaching for their dreams is when things start to manifest. They, well, all, all along the way, from the beginning to manifestation, even when they have it, we have self-sabotaging behaviors that sometimes kick in. And I was wondering yeah. if you face that and how do you address it? Absolutely. You know, and I don't know if this story will be as helpful, helpful or not. So I absolutely had the self-sabotage where my mom wanted me to go to this huge, huge jazz festival that she's been going for the last 11 years and it's a jazz festival with mostly um you know black patrons so i was yeah i want to go and because i do you know mermaids and elves and things like that even though they're always black like i said black artwork is usually more very political it's very edgy it's you know or you're doing you know sex uh popular stuff, pop culture, where, you know, maybe a celebrity, a musician, something like that. And I'm doing Black mermaids and stuff. I was like, I, I had this, that my art wasn't Black enough. With jazz festival, it needs to be super Black. It's not Black enough. Mermaids aren't Black enough, even if they're Black mermaids. And what I ended up doing is I, I made this series of head wraps where the woman, you know, you saw the head wrap, it was in my slide um, where she had wrap and she had an earring that said black girl magic. I was like, yeah, was like black, black, you know, extra black, no more mermaids. And that was my, my fear of let me change my artwork because it's not good enough. And the reason I said this story isn't maybe the best is because that head wrap series is extremely popular. <laughs> I can't even get rid of it. Everybody really did love it. So my moment of self-doubt where mermaids weren't good enough and I made these head wraps out of fear, it turns out they really did love the head wraps to the point that I had to make an, another series. So there's part two of the head wrap. Um, but I will say for artists that do have that fear of self-sabotage, your stuff isn't good enough, what I'm doing is not good enough, difficult but just tune them out and just keep doing what you're doing and it's also in a sense of if you build it they'll come so you keep doing what you do and your audience will show up and one thing I really love is the masters that we we look at in the museums and um, even in you know art galleries you know the Barnes Museum and the Philadelphia Art Museum what people don't realize is that those artists were hated during their times some of their stuff ever sold, they died penniless, and now their, their work goes for millions upon millions of dollars. So if you think that your artwork isn't good enough, you could say, you know what, it is good enough. It's just not for this generation. It's just beyond, it's just before his time. Like Van Gogh, Van Gogh, everybody said his work was horrible and it just wasn't for their time. Now there's value everywhere. <laughs> yeah, artists are often on the forefront of things. They're often decades ahead of their time. So it's almost to be expected that your work may not be as embraced, or if, it, if at all. Right. It's like, it will be, just remind yourself, it will be embraced. It may not be embraced in your time, which I know you really want it to be, and that really sucks, but just know that if your heart is in it and that's what you're supposed to be, that's your purpose, it's going to be embraced. Like generations from now, you'll be up there in the afterlife looking down like, oh, snap. 
that nobody wanted 30 years ago is going for $7 million? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I, I think of, as a, of you as an else, I think the illustrator thing of fine art is such a commercially marketable way to be an artist. Like you're totally an artist. You get to do things that, that are birthed in your mind and your visions, you get to do that. But then you get to do things for magazines too. <laughs> did you plan that at some point? Did at some point did you think, what can I do with this to make a living? Nope. <laughs> I was not ever thinking about how can I monetize this? It was just, I want to draw and that's, that's what I'm going to do and the money will show up whenever it does. And to be honest, uh, when I was little, there, was, there wasn't was a lot of art representation. So I knew I wanted to be an artist. I knew I wanted to draw, but I didn't know what the name was. I didn't know art. I didn't know illustrator. I didn't know art director. I didn't know all the proper terms. So when the teacher asked what you want to be when you grow up, I couldn't say, I just want to draw because that's what I, it's still what I want to do. <laughs> um, I told him I wanted to be a nurse like my, like my aunt. Um, I want to be an illustrator. I just wanted to draw. And the whole illustration thing and um, that I was in college and or um, maybe a little bit younger because I love reading Rainbow and they would show you all the illustrations from the books. And I was like, I love looking at the illustrations in the book. So I thought, oh, I, I want to do that. Illustrate a book. And I got this and they had a major for it. And I said, OK, I'm going to be a book illustrator. And it turns out um, that I actually don't want to be a book, book illustrator. <laughs> After all this time, I got a job being an illustrator, illustrating a 23-page book. And I found, ooh, that's too much work for me. I don't want to do this. <laughs> but I will illustrate book covers. So if you want a book cover done, I will definitely do that. <laughs> I will illustrate book covers. But the whole 60, 20, 30 page book now. <laughs> I love how you get to pick and choose. That's, that's, that's my favorite. It's really awesome. Did you see that a chat question came in? I did. And of course, it's from my mother. <laughs> okay, she said, what would you say is the best way for an, up, for an upcoming artist to start selling their work? Yeah, they hit me with that. Okay, I didn't even see that coming. Uh, <laughs> okay. Sell their work. Um, now, to get your work out there, you know, social media, they can, you know, people see it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your work's going to get sold. Um, I would say going to art events was the biggest one. Because I know a lot of uh, people tell you it's about going to galleries. Not saying that galleries aren't awesome, you know, shameless plug right there. <laughs> Being in an art gallery is good. It is really good. But it's so messy to be in an art gallery to the point that uh, up-and-coming artists, most galleries don't even have a submission. You submit your art. It's just you got to know somebody who knew somebody or know the curator. So... Oh, man. And that's one of the, that's the biggest reason that I opened up my own art gallery is because I want to change that. The art gallery, the biggest way for me as an upcoming artist and for what I saw as other upcoming artists to sell your work is events. In fact, that's how I know, that's how I'm here with the Black Women's Festival with Cassandra. You were an event <laughs> that I was in and I was selling my work. So I think festivals, art festivals, um, Street festivals are good too, but know that when you're going to these type of things, sometimes it's a hit or miss. So just be prepared. And when you bring your work, don't always just have originals. Bring some other stuff at different prices. Bring coloring books, bring prints and things like that. And also, if you can, Get your portfolio viewed by um, somebody. Get a portfolio review. So how to grow with your work. If you're a self-taught artist, if you 
and have a portfolio review so that um, somebody, you know, look through it and say, here's where you can improve, here's where your strengths are. Can I chime in as well? Sure. Coffee houses, you know, cafes, restaurants, like, and coffee houses, restaurants, because I've known people who have been, like I had a roommate once who wanted to show her photography and she was new and she started doing that. And it's like coffee houses. And I remember when I worked at Borders Bookshop when it was in Rittenhouse Square, um, we had a lot. There was a woman, that, woman who worked for Borders who would bring in art. She just had a series of people all the time. And so we had, we had a lot of art and it was changing periodically like for, cause some would sell um, and then we would just get more. So like independently owned businesses like restaurants. So if you're an artist or a photographer that's a great way to go if you're really in the beginning of your career. And so I'm like, I'm glad you chimed in because I forgot about that because that was that is a great way to do it. I've had friends too, and I've done that where I've done art in um, boutiques that was up in Chestnut Hill or um, a bookstore or something like that. That is a really those are really good places to put your work. Yeah. 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 This is going to sound a little bit left field, but do you know a lot of times when a woman owns her own business and stuff. At some point there are the questions of like, do you want to get married? Do you want to have children? How do you see that going? But nobody asks, nobody ever thinks to ask a man that. Mm -hmm. But I do find myself thinking, have, have you thought about, you know, 10 years from now, what your life is going to look like? Do you see yourself as being single or do you see yourself as having a family? Oh yeah, I'm, I definitely do want a family. And my mom has already, okay, so the Lord has already told her that I'm going to bequeath my company to my, you know, to her grandson in the future, and he's going to take my business public. So, you know, there's, there's a little son in the future. Um, I do definitely do want to get, um, get married and have children. And the big thing, because doing this, I want it as a, as a legacy. That's leaving generational wealth down to my family members. And also, you know, things that I never even thought of before starting this business. Like I don't just, I don't want an apartment or a house. I want land. <laughs> I want I want land, you know, and an estate and things like that. Like I want I got some big, big accomplishments and some big dreams in there. Um, and, but I already knew that I was not, there were some things that I wanted to accomplish before I started going down that route of into a relationship, into a future kind of thing. And also on top of that, I wanted to know how to do it properly because I've never, you know, uh, dated um, I've dated, you know, the way the world kind of does it, where it's like you just you just hanging out for years and then y'all just magically get married or have kids and never get married or something like that. I really wanted to do it properly where it's a, it's really a partnership is really supportive. I support you. You support me. We are growing together. Um, so I'm like I'm. I want that in the future, but I ain't rushing. I'm like. And that person comes when we gel, that's when that's when it happens. <laughs> it's big. Did you see the chat that just came in from uh, Stephanie Duran, AKA the other name? About not being black enough. Oh, not being black enough. I feel like that's been my experience as well. To work to make more room for art that not be considered black mainstream. There's a place for all of us, regardless of background. That is so, that is amazing. And I love black mainstream because I never know the word when I'm just, when people ask me that question, I never know the word. So I'm going to use that black mainstream. And you know what? I work that I actually showed you is for a art, um, uh, art fair or art event 
that I was introduced to back in college is called Ilexcon. And it's the best of the best fantasy artists in the industry. Being it since then, I love it. I'm, I'm going again in October just to look at the artists, but I noticed something that every single person, they have two shows, they have a show of main artists, which is 90 artists, and then they have a show of um, 150 artists. And out of all those artists, 90 and 150, like, there's no black artists in that show at all. I when I was when I went to the show last year, that was my first time being in it. I was either one or two of like that was that was in the entire thing, and I I know a bunch of a bunch of black art and just black people in general that love fantasy art. Why am I the only black artist here? It it does need to be open for you know. Uh, Black illustrators and Black artists doing fantasy work and being in those type of shows. What was the last thing that you said? I'm sorry, was I cutting out? Oh, a smidge, yeah. I'm sorry, um, I was just saying, uh, did you catch the thing about being at uh, Ilexcon and there were no artists there? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So it was, it was just, just saying- the last words of your sentence. Oh, I was just saying that uh, Black artists and Black people in general that are, they love fantasy art and they need to be in this show because it's so surprising that out of 90 artists and 150 artists, there are no Black artists there when I know that there are definitely amazing Black fantasy artists. Yeah, no reason for that. And well, uh, can I ask you a question? Us as in the collective? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, no, I mean, you're the I only one, the only one I can me. see on my screen, so that's why I said you. I will uh, totally field questions. Yes. But since we're on the subject of, um, you know, mainstream Black art and, you know, think about, you know, is your art Black enough? Is that something, because you're a musician, is something in the music industry that's also felt where it's like either your art is too Black because it's like you're a rapper or something like that is too Black. Or if you're not a rapper, because I know you play guitar, do you feel like your work is not part of the Black community because I'm not a rapper or something? There are Black people who play acoustic guitar in a Black way, like India Ari, for instance. She's very R&B, um, she just happens to play an acoustic guitar. In my world of music, it, uh, it has only helped me. One of my earliest managers told me once, she, she said, you know what, you have what the, what the uh, record execs, that this is when, this was the 90s, early 90s, when record labels had power and you wanted to try to get their attention. And um, she said, you have what they want. You're black, but you sound white. And that's, that's why Tracy Chapman was so big. And, and then if you're white, like Christina Aguilera, but you sound black, or if you're white, like Tina Marie. And you sound, so if you're like, if you got these two things going, that's a very appealing. I've, I, I mean, I grew up being called an Oreo. So outside of the poetry world, outside of the music world, I'm definitely always constantly being accused of not being black enough. But I, but I'm 52, three now. So that means that I don't give a hoot at all. I just don't care what people think. But yeah, it hurts though. It kind of hurts when you, when you what, what we all want is acceptance. We want to be accepted. We want our art to be embraced. And also our art is a, an expression of us. We shouldn't have to tailor it for anyone's needs. Um, I remember early on in the festival, I was trying to describe what kind of art we would take. And I would say, if you're a black woman doing something, I'm interested. 
you know, it doesn't have to be black art. Like if you, if you went to Tibet and you talked to some Sherpas and you made a, a little film out of it, that's guess what? Because you made it, if that's black, black art. That's what I think. Um, but apparently not everybody thinks that way. And that's just, it's probably always gonna be that way. And we'll, we'll just have to keep being ourselves, keep making our art. And then we'll find that some people embrace it as you have, or in your case, a lot of people embrace it. And it's so funny that you say the Oreo thing and because that's that was my story too, where everybody said, Erica, you talk, you know, you talk, you you sound white. It was things like that, where it was like, or you know, I think mom said somebody at her job, even in corporate America, they were like, You're black, but you're not black. So I had that. So there's, it was almost inevitable that in my art, I was going to feel that it wasn't black enough because everybody's been telling me that I haven't, that I'm not black enough. Yeah. <laughs> it's been drummed in. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it should just be black art because I'm black. It should be super, super duper black. Yeah. Which, what that. does that mean? <laughs> What we're doing right now is like a panel, which we've had in person at the festival. We had a panel of, you know, four or three or four artists, and then we have the audience asking questions and I would, I would moderate. So this feels kind of like that to me because we're just going back, back and forth um, with questions. So little known secret, Kai and I are both really into soulmates. And the one thing that he's, we used to talk for a long time about, you know, what you do to attract a soulmate and all of that stuff. And then he had, so now, now he talks about how to find your soulmate clients, you know, how to, to connect with the people who are meant to see your work. Um, maybe not clients necessarily because he does life coaching. Not, so not always clients, but customers. So I just have to go back to this marriage question, which is, I'm just curious. I don't want to assume that because you're a black woman that you want to partner with a black man. But if you did, my question would be, and here it comes, like, how do I word this? Um, you're building, and as you said, you're, you're, you've, you know, you have your own gallery, that is no small feat, you know? And then, and then you're gonna be building bigger things, even bigger things. And I think it's fact that Black women are among the highest earning demographic. So my understanding is that there's this, sometimes there's an issue with dating where Black men don't necessarily feel necessary. Um, Steve Harvey goes, talks about this. You know, you meet a strong, independent woman and she looks like she doesn't need Jack from you. She's got everything she needs. And so that makes you not as attractive to the Black man because he's it's, and not every black man is like this. He could be Ivy League educated, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I don't know, do you give any, I mean, I see you as being very abundant and that you, and your partner is out there. That's what I, that's what I see. Especially the, even the way you were talking about, you know, you want somebody to partner with and have it, intentions together and grow with each other. Um, I know you're wondering what the question is. Do you know what the question is? Yes, I do. You were. Um, and put me out of my misery, please. <laughs> well, we'll say the answer that you're going to get is not the answer that you were going to expect. I'm actually. Actually, you're into it, but, Asian guys. I'm just kidding. Huh? You're into Asian dudes. No, I mean, I do. I, they are beautiful, but no, nope, I'm the white chocolate. White chocolate for me. Oh, it's I, white. Yes. It's I, always has I, been. And I can I will tell you, you know, because this growth that I have been on, I've been on a, you know, a growth journey and exactly why I am attracted to Caucasian men, because I know a lot of people are probably wondering why. And I've been asked that several times in my life. Why? Why? Why are you like, why? It's, why? it's out there for you. Why? And I can never answer the question, so I would pull little facts where I would go, well, you know, there's so many Black women out there that want Black men and keep saying that there's a shortage of good Black men. So I'm like, basically, I just 
even the odds for you guys because I'm not going for the black man. I'm going for the other side. But that's not the truth. I was just using facts. I was like, you know, I just even the odds for you because I'm not in the game anymore. I'm on the other side. The real reason is a little bit of childhood trauma. So when I was a little girl, as you can clearly see, I'm big, you know, so of course I get teased when I'm a little girl, but surprisingly or unsurprisingly to maybe other people that was teased when they were younger, I always got teased by black girls and the black boys. And the only people that did not tease me and were actually very kind and friendly to me were all of the white girls and boys. So that's where it went. That's where it comes from. My attraction to white men was, you know, um, it was mean to me. The white guys well, weren't. <laughs> I too am down with the swirl, as they say. And I've always been ever since, I don't know, age 20 or something. No, I mean, I remember being a kid and being all into the very, very, very gay George Michael. So, but I think that um, the trauma thing is huge. Even though I can make a long list of why I'm naturally, I partnered with white dudes. Um, but you know what, what, I could make a long list. But one of the reasons is I, I'm never not black enough. You know what I mean? I, I never have to try to be some other way. I never have to be harder than I am. I don't have to move my neck when I talk or anything like that. So they're just a bunch of reasons. So yeah, pl that plus trauma. Well, my trauma thing was that I, the perpetrator of my abuse was black. So that, that always made it, it, it difficult. I'm actually triggered by black men of a certain age. So that kind of makes it that easier. They don't look like my abuser. Um, well, that's definitely going to make your that that much easier for. I, I see it like very clearly now. I see it very clear. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, my thankfully, my family has never been the type of family where it's like, oh, you you know, you ain't going to date no black dudes. If anything, they've been very supportive. They will. Somebody tries to set me up. The first thing they'll say is, you know, Erica don't like black guys, right? <laughs> live warm people that wait a minute I know. before you do it's, that it's such, is he white or is he black <laughs> it's such a horrible thing because we have um we have a, a, a minute left before i introduce the other person but it just makes me so guilty because i feel like the way the world is towards black men i feel like they should be embraced by as many different sources and as possible but you know you, you like what you like you either like yeah. chocolate or you just like what you like and it's just be true to yourself and yeah it's I, just part we agree yeah. yeah i like i love this conversation we're having because i feel a kindred spirit because i'm like i have the same guilt where i'm like i should be you know but i should it's like you know but i like what i like and um my mother did say okay so now that you know why you are attracted to black men is because of their childhood trauma now that you know where it is i mean you're attracted to white men that is yes you're still attracted to white men so you're most likely going to date them but if a good honorable black man does step you don't just write them off because they're black give them a chance you know it's tricky there are tons of good honorable and even good looking to you you know black men but that doesn't to me i kind of like equate it to the gay thing because because i'm approached because i do online personal dating kind of thing and I'm approached sometimes, even though my profile is very gosh darn too clear, somebody will approach me who is melanin enriched like me. And then he's just like, well, why, why not? What's, you know, almost like, what's the, what's the big difference? What's the big deal? And it's like, well, would you go out with a, like, I don't know, 90 year old white guy if he stepped to you? And he could just say, well, you know, why not? Why not? You know, why not? Is because I know what I want is why not? There you go. All right. I like, and you said you were, you were, um, you, you said you were in your fifties. You don't look it. You really don't. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And up I close, you can see little, little grays up close. The little grays. I will say you are that 50 thing. I get it now. Cause my mom is in her fifties and it's that, that I, I don't give a F. It's like, I guess it really does come where it's like, I like what I like. I ain't got this. <laughs> we don't have. Okay. 
No time. <laughs> well, Erica, thank you so much. This has been absolutely delightful. I'm really glad thank that you, you left the space in your program to allow to allow magic to happen. <laughs> um, so, <that laughs> and uh, I wish you so much luck in, in finding the love of your life. You definitely are doing so well, and it's wonderful. It's very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking tomorrow night. I'll, I'll make sure yeah. I have a bit more to say. <laughs> right, so this doesn't have to be some big old goodbye. We'll see you tomorrow. Yes. And to be sure, what time are you on tomorrow in case somebody wants to see you again tomorrow? 4.40. Yes. Erica Richards is on again tomorrow. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, folks, so this is a part of the program called In Memoriam, which means in, in memory of. Uh, the first person I'm gonna talk about is Monette Sudler, and the second person I'm gonna talk about is Dr. Niyama Williams. So there are several things that are different about the festival when we're in person versus when we're virtual. When we're in person, we have features like all people's open mic. We have vendors, we have catered food. Uh, not catered food, we have vendors who, have, who feed us, right. Um, and we have um, something called, well, how we close the festival every year usually is a ceremony to honor our ancestors and elders. And it's, a, and it's an audience participation thing. So in the last two years, we've been virtual due to the pandemic, and we haven't done any of the honoring those who have gone before us. Um, and so something happened recently. We're not gonna do anything to honor our ancestors and elders, but we are gonna remember two women who, who passed. And what brought this up is, um, my sister called me recently and said, hey, you know what, I've just been seeing all over Facebook that um, Monette Sudler pa passed away. And do you, do you think it might be a neat thing to talk about her um, at the festival as another black woman guitarist? And I said to her, yeah, I heard about it like three weeks ago. I heard about it also on Facebook. And um, I think that would be a good idea. Um, what's going on? Started, oh, you're starting to screen share. Thank you, Gina. And uh, I think that would be a good idea. So um, what I'm gonna do is uh, read something from a PowerPoint, a PowerPoint presentation to talk about uh, who Monette was. She was a Philadelphia based jazz guitarist. She was pretty legendary. And at age of 70, she passed away. Uh, at first I read that it was lung disease, and then I saw on Wikipedia that it was uh, a blood cancer. She was a very youthful 70, and I think people were surprised. I certainly was surprised uh, because she was still very vibrant and performing. Thank you, Gina. Look how intuitive you are. Okay, so. So there's a picture there of Monette Sudler. And I'll read the bio and then I will tell you a little story about her. Sudler was born Monette Goldman in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her mother, Leah Goldman, married um, Truman Sudler in 1957. This is her early years. She grew up in the nice town, Tioga, Tioga neighborhood of um, Philadelphia. Her first exposure to jazz, let me just move my picture on over so I can see, was listening to her great uncle play piano. When she was 15, she took lessons on guitar at the Wharton Center um, in Philadelphia. She could play drums and, pan and piano and bass. And she also composed, why does it not say garage, guitar? Right, she took guitar lessons. So she was a guitarist, drummer, pianist, and bassist. And she also composed, arranged, 
sang and wrote poetry. Early in her career, she worked with vibraphonist um, Khan Jamal. I think I'm going to not go into, because it's so vast. If we scroll down, you can see um, that there are a lot of musicians that she played with. Let me scroll down a little, thank you. So those are all the names of the people that she played with. And I'm guessing most of them are jazz musicians. And she, she uh, thank you, Gina, we can be on the last page. So, so she died from blood cancer uh, on August 21st, 2022 at the age of 70. So here's a little trivia. There used to be a show on, on PBS on channel 12 called On Sistas. And I don't remember the name of the host, but it was a woman, a black woman who hosted it. And one day um, I was invited to be featured on that show. And another person named Trapita B. Mason, who's a Liberian American poet was, was the co-guest. So both Trapita and I were on that uh, show. I did music, Trapita did poetry, and we were both interviewed by the host of Aunt Sisters. Years later, Trapita would uh, collaborate with Monette Sudler. I never saw the work that they did, but I heard about it and I think it went on for years that they collaborated musically. I didn't know that Monette was a, um, a poet. And until I was researching her for this, I didn't know that she played bass. Um, I think I might've known that she played drums. So the last thing I wanted to say about Monette to tie it to a personal story with me, oh, first let me address it, address what my sister had suggested that I talk about her influence on me as a, as a guitarist. She was influential to me because she played a jazz guitar and she played lead. Most women who play guitar um, play, play rhythm like I do. They don't really play lead. But here was a black woman in my town, no less, who played lead. Um, and that was extremely impressive to me. I had the good fortune of being an editor of Labyrinth, the Philadelphia women's newspaper years ago. And I got to just pick whoever I wanted to interview. So I interviewed the Gorilla Girls, um, you know, the, the art activists and a lesbian author named Joanne Lulin. And, uh, and I also interviewed Manette Sudler. When you're in the press, you can just approach people and because you find them interesting, you can do a story on them. So I did an interview with Monette Sudler and the thing that jumps out at me, it was at a gig. She talked to me like during her breaks. <laughs> and um, so I interviewed her, but the thing that I remember about her is that she had on these flat dressy sandals. They were like gold or something. And they were the kind of flat sandals that you wrap around your ankles, you know? And um, she was walking around with the laces like all undone. It was like she was at home. And, and I felt really, I felt honored to be spending this time with her as if she was just padding around her living room. And she's at a gig where other people are around. She just wanted to be comfortable. And some singers take their shoes off on stage, like Chardet performs without her shoes. Katie Lang often performs without her shoes on. Um, Franti, Michael Franti, I forget his first name, but Michael Franti, I believe is his name, the dreadlocked guy. Uh, he's always barefoot. So yeah, she just wanted to be comfortable. So that's, that's the memory that I have of her and seeing her periodically, because I was in town the same stretch of time that she was in town and I would periodically see her at various gigs. And I'm very, very grateful to have shared the same spaces with her and to have met her and spoken with her about her craft and about her life. And uh, she's, she's touched many lives and experienced, it, it inspired many. So thanks for letting me um, bring her up and, and talk about her and share uh, 
some, you know, some of the facts about her life with you. So thank you, Gina. I am going to do the next in memoriam now, in memoriam, uh, Dr. Niyama Williams. So see, Niyama has a very long, a long uh, profile, but I'm going to read it um, because I have until 6.30, yeah? 6.30. Yeah, I think, I think I can make it work. What I'll do is I'll first say personal things about her and then um, we'll try to get through this uh, together. <laughs> um, so Dr. Niyama Leslie Joanne Williams, PhD, is a woman I met in the, er, in the mid to late 90s, 1996 to 1999. I ran a support group. I founded and host and facilitated a support group called Sisters Healing Together. Um, I won't tell you the exact subtitle because it might be triggering to some people. And I also don't have her family's permission to disclose a lot of stuff. So I'll just say that it was for women survivors of, of sexual abuse with a special focus on uh, eating disorders. Those two things go together a lot. A lot of times when women are sexually abused, it throws our eating off kilter. And if you were abused as a child, that can be a lifelong issue. She was one of the first people to come to my group and we instantly became friends and we would talk on the phone. And I say that because over the years, including especially the pandemic, I have become so introverted that I rarely just talk on, on the phone with people. I think that's happened to a lot of people. We just, we just text if we have to. <laughs> um, but one thing about her, a story that I'd like to tell, because that's how we keep folks with us, to tell stories, is I was hanging out at her house one day and Law and Order came on, Special Victims Unit. We were talking about how we loved that, how we loved that show. And she said the reason that she loved that show so much is because the, because it feels so great when the bad guys are caught and they face justice. And I never knew that that's why I liked it. Now I know that all the true crime that I watch is because I like to watch the bad guys get caught. Um, so that was one conversation I had with her. And then another conversation I had with her that, that stays with me is um, about suicide. So with my mental health issues, I have had suicidal ideations since I was a child. So thoughts of suicide are never far away. And she had similar issues and also a lot of suicidal ideation. And, and what she told me and what we both agreed on is that the only thing that kept us alive at that time for, from, is uh, the Christian idea of hell. We both had been raised with that idea of hell and we didn't want to go to hell. So we didn't kill ourselves. But by the time we became more adults, we had relaxed those views and we, you know, so that's pros and cons. On the one hand, if you don't really believe in that kind of hell, there's nothing really keeping you from killing yourself. Um, and I'm talking about this because it's really important because um, mental health issues are finally getting the attention they deserve in the, in the world, finally. Um, so Dr. Niyama Williams was brilliant. She self-published 14 books. They're on Amazon and they're on Lulu. Um, so even, in, even posthumously, you can still purchase her works. Um, and she was a very charming, she had the most delightful, lilting, light, high-pitched laugh. Um, and she was really a wonderful person. She spent so by the time I met her, and she was also a friend to the festival, she let me and Spirit McIntyre use her home as an office for the festival. Checking time. Oh, I have three minutes to say a lot of stuff. Um, so she was very sweet and very generous and very bright. Here's how bright she was. She got her PhD in, I wanna say 
either months or a year. Couldn't have been months, but not much more than a year. And in my life, I have known people to take up to 13 years to get their PhD. And she got her so quickly. And, and she was very bright in a lot of different things because she did her own publishing formatting. Um, she figured it out herself. So, so I guess I should get to the point. Dr. Niyama Williams um, committed suicide in 2016. Even though she had been in Philadelphia for some years, she was originally from California and she was back again in Long Beach, California. She had been struggling with homelessness. And even though she conquered it for a bit, my feeling is that something happens and, and it just was too tired. When you think about suicide, it's always the same thing. I'm tired. That's, those are the two words that I'm, too, I'm tired. So I just think that she probably got tired of fighting. And I wanted to just bring her memory up to, um, to keep her alive in a way. So in memoriam, Dr. Niyama Williams. Gina, would you be willing to scroll down a little bit? Thank you. She says, I wanted to take the words from herself because I always thought she expressed herself very, very well. I am an author, writer of memoir, a poet, a personal essayist, a public speaker, intuitive and workshop facilitator. My primary concerns are social service providers and their clients. Having risen above homelessness in Long Beach, California, I remain radicalized by that experience. I am determined to offer workshops and emphasizing the critical relationship between meditation, regular spiritual practice, and mindset change in the building of a spiritual grit that will sustain the soul empower and assist those suffering from stress, overwork, burnout, and the onslaught of social ills. And this, can we pass this one? And the last one. My tales of rising above life challenges both heal and fortify the soul while instructing in how to concretely incorporate meditation, regular spiritual practice and mindset change. So thank you for letting me share this, uh, this in memoriam series. I'm glad that we were able to do something even though we we're virtual, but something to remember um, Monette never featured in the festival, but Niyama did at least at least twice. Um, and I miss her and I and I'm very grateful that she shone her light so brightly while she was with us. Thank you, Gina. All right. I hope everybody's doing well. It's 630 and it's time to introduce the um, next feature, who is sincere melody. I'm just gonna go onto my phone. Actually, can I see, um, let me put on gallery view. There you are, look at you looking all glorious. Wonderful, so here we go. Um, let me go back. And just looking up your bio and I have it right here. Sean E. Fulton, stage name Sincere Melody, is a daughter, sister, mother, aunt, poet, author, human. Born and raised in the Philadelphia and surrounding areas, Sean says, I have been writing poetry for over 20 years and performing off and on for most of my life. I write as a form of therapy. Everyone has a story and I listen and incorporate it into spoken word. Here to be of help, to anyone I come across, forward motion. Please welcome Sincere Melody. Hi, is everyone doing? I am Sincere Melody. Thank you so much, Cassandra, for a beautiful, beautiful, um, everything that everyone is doing. And I listen to your um everything that you did and 
I have gone through a lot of what she went through. I write, yes, indeed, for a form of therapy. I have been through a lot in my young, almost 50 years coming up, and I'm going to give everybody a taste of what it is that I write in my form of therapy. My first piece is entitled, I Can Only Try, because that's what we are trying to do in this world, try. I'm on a mission, truly, truly focused, a lot of us, away from, away from, moving away from tradition, moving away from tradition. Lovers of mankind, so ready to judge, not recognizing when you point a finger, three, point back at you. Cleansing my mind on the daily, focused, have to stay focused because the devil, Shaitan, is busy at work. His minions, demons, trying to stay at on my heels, on my shoulders, hovering. Over me hmm. are angels, angels hovering over me. I'm protected, hmm. watching the light as I'm so full of it. They say they can see my aura. They say they can see my shine. I'm walking amongst my and walking for my ancestors. They are frankly, truly divine. They were truly, truly divine. I am only me. I can only be me. I am praying, 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 praying constantly, trying to be better, trying to walk better, trying to eat better, consuming all that is good, trying to live eat to live better, trying, trying, trying to do better, trying, trying, trying. All I can do is try. Da 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 all I can do, all I can do is be me. I can only try. My next piece is called People. Trying times, these times. And this piece was literally written because <laughs> it's just that. These times. And it's a lot going on. And this was written a while back, but I enhanced it, remixed it, as they say, to incorporate things that are going on now. These are challenging times, and I would say it was a challenge to write this rhyme or poem, semantics, but it's not. Every time I view the news, I get another view into or side of someone's misfortune. 
so many tragedies. My eyes are filled with tears and my ears bleed at the sound of selfishness and greed. The ones elected by, the ones elected to bring forth change, <laughs> change. Billions going out, but how much is coming in? <laughs> Supply and demand. That's what we've been doing to no avail. To no avail. This crazy, crazy world we live in. People take, people take more than they're giving. In this crazy, crazy world we live in. People take, people take more than they're giving so many murders in this city of brotherly love where is the love to be exact rather than go play rather than go play so many rather gun play our children that is our children Rather be out there like it's the wild, wild west, losing their lives. They're simply now extinct. So we have no future. As Whitney once said, the children are our future. Where are they? This crazy, crazy world we live in. People take. People take more than they're giving. No concept of tomorrow, only living for today, but can't make it through a day without cussing and fighting. And I'm talking about your teachers and your only 14. Hmm. Help me understand. You have no thought of furthering your education. I would say the system has failed you. I would say that. But no, every day I see the same faces doing the same things. I would say the system has failed you. But no, it's not totally the system's fault. You, me, we must reflect on what we are doing wrong. Together, individually and collectively, in this crazy, crazy world we live in. People take, people take more than they're giving. My next piece is called going because sometimes we just don't know where we're going. We just end up someplace. It's a process. Do you know where you're going to? Do you like the things this life is showing you? How clever we are as we walk the tightrope high above the air to ourselves saying, I can't give up hope with a blank stare and the weight of the world on our shoulders to bear. Where are you going to? Do you know? I have no idea from one day to the next just going in circles, it seems, trying to live out my dreams. But it's hard to keep hope alive sometimes when I'm slowly dying inside. So
So I constantly stay on the go or try to in order to maintain my focus. There's that word again, focus. My two children look at me and wonder why sometimes tears just roll down mommy's eyes. And I'm screaming because there's not enough milk. So I can have a bowl of cereal to fill me with sustenance to make it through the day. Just trying to make it. Can't let them take it from me. Just trying to take what you say, anything that belongs to me. Most importantly, my, my, my sanity. My sanity can be lost within these four white walls. Hmm. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. Have to get out of this place and figure out where I'm going before it's all too late. I gotta keep one foot moving in front of the other moving in front of the other in order to transcend, transcend way beyond my own expectations. Oh, how hard that can be, always being my own worst critic. Nonetheless, I continue on treading lightly, always remembering the mistakes. They don't rear, so they don't rear their ugly heads again and stifle me. For I know in this world to get to where you're going or want to be, persistence is key. So as those four precious eyes watch with heartfelt anticipation, I cautiously proceed, giving precedence to reaching a higher level of spirituality and intellect without being hindered. So again, I ask, do you know who you're going to? And do you like the things that life is showing you? I want to give a shout out to my beautiful, beautiful adult children that have always been there for me. I thank them. And I thank my daughter for doing this beautiful makeup for me today. I love you, babies. Thank you. This next piece is entitled Reality because we all have to have a sense of reality. And sometimes I know I lose it, but I thank all my support systems for being there all the time when I need it. So just remember when you need somebody, turn to your support systems. And sometimes you might not know who they are. It might be a stranger, but we all need to have somebody to reach out when you need to talk. This is called reality. Constant reality hovering over me. I open my eyes to see all that is and all that will be my reality want to escape forever trying some of us even buying what we think we need to heed a getaway but can't not from reality the high doesn't last long enough and soon as it's gone your back, eyes slowly open, then you realize you never left. Constant reality <laughs> hovering over me. And my endless nights living alone, no one to call my own, holding on tight to anyone in sight, not knowing whether or not their futures bright. Must be hallucinating on this bad 
trip. Me trying to fill a void or fix the inner me as the exterior glows. <laughs> but it's all an illusion. My mind so full of tragic confusion. My body being depleted as I distribute my wealth from my temple as they invade my domicile. I fall to my knees as they are in distress as I pray to God. I relinquish all my rage, let out a scream. Damn, how I wish this was all just a dream. But it's not. It's constant reality. And it's hovering over me. I open my eyes to see my constant reality. I gotta get away from this sadness, all this horrific madness. How do you escape the blue when you feel like it's you? You can't. I wish I could simply just fly away, but I can't. God didn't bless me with wings. He gave me legs, so I guess I will run, run to the ends of the earth, trying to find me while climbing over every mountain top, swimming through every ocean and every sea. Hope to find my true identity. I just want to get away from the sad melodies of these blues. This is my constant reality. Hovering over me. I open my eyes to see my constant reality. This last piece is entitled Poetry. Poetry is just that. It's what I am, it's how I feel, and it's all of me. Here it goes. Love of my life, you are my friend. Love of my life, on you I can depend. So I sample true love. Poetry, that's how it's affected me. Been flowing through my veins since infancy. Whether it be poetic verse or song, it's all adds up, it all adds up to the same. And it's not a game, it's my life and I love it. See, I rehearse and rehearse and rehearse every line. Then I get on stage and blow it. Cause I can't remember nothing. You see me right here reading this in this book. I'm kindly reminded, girlfriend, it's yours. You wrote it. You already know it. Then I smile. Yeah, that's true. So next week, I'm going to be on fire. Because I love you, baby. Love of my life. You are my friend. Love of my life. On you I can be paid. Hmm. And I know that's right. Because that's just what I do when I'm sad. When I'm glad. On whatever I can find. Sometimes it's not even mine. Borrowed. Don't act like you never did it. When you were out and about. That's right. On the L. Y'all know the L train. Excuse me, do you have a pen? And while you're at it, a piece of paper or a napkin? 
as Vivian Green put it, it's my therapy. And I've been up late plenty of nights just writing and writing and writing, contemplating my next peace of mind. Anything for the love of my life. Poetry. Well, I have time for just one more. And this is called a thought because we all have plenty of thoughts about maybe another love. He asked me to love him and I did. Absorbed into his skin like shea butter, a hundred percent pure. Just like the stuff you find around the way at the Indian store. I rubbed it all over me, all over me. But even deeper than that, I connected to his conscious and unconscious thoughts. Hmm, that's right, his mind. Hmm, it was never, never reciprocated. He gave me nothing. So tell me, what you think about that? I'm Sincere Melody. Everybody, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really wonderful. And this is the first spoken word that we've had. I always, sometimes I wonder, what's the difference between poetry and spoken word? I think spoken word is performed. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and you started out singing. <laughs> so um, that was actually special. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. And how, how did you find us? So um, actually, my aunt had sent me the flyer, and, and that's how I was um, introduced to it. Yeah. Wow, I'm glad you I'm glad you approached us and Kai says your share was beautiful and with a heart. Oh, thank you, Kai. <laughs> yeah, that was really, really wonderful. Are you you're back tomorrow, right? Yes, ma'am. You're on at 110. Right at 110. Oh, you're the first act. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Space. You open the space for us tomorrow. That's great. And you closed it today. You closed yeah. the space and now you're going to open the space tomorrow. That's fabulous. Yes, ma'am. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, this concludes the um, 16th Annual Black Women's Arts Festival. I am at the Rotunda and hopefully next year you all will be at the Rotunda as well. Um, and yeah, but this was really wonderful. And I thank everybody for participating. And we will be back here tomorrow from one o'clock until seven o'clock. And there will be some familiar faces and some of the new faces will be Aisha Mullock, filmmaker, Keisha Oliver, artist, writer, and Ghetto Songbird. So that's gonna be exciting. So thanks everybody. Have a good night. I'm going to stay on and talk to Gina for a little while because we have tough stuff to do. But I bid everybody also good night. Good night, Kai. Good night, Sean. Thank you.